holy crap. People persist in doubting the evidence. Don't run and hide. Don't be afraid. Don't turn away any longer. The truth will set you free. You're listening to Jimmy Church Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. We're turning all of our partners towards the Twitter Center on Dark Matter Radio. <laughs> and now, your host, the captain of conspiracy, the prince of paranormal. This ain't your daddy's radio network show. This is Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Yeah. Is this on? Is this on? Check. Check. Just messing with you. <laughs> that ain't right, is it? Oh, yeah. Put your frog in a blender. Your frog in a blender. I don't even want to read that tweet. This is Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Today's Tuesday, November 25th. We are 326 days into the new year. We are live from the JP Motorsports Studios right here, downtown Burbank, California. For KJCR on the Dark Matter Radio Network, I am your oh so humble host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking? Let's go. Let's uh, let's go on a journey tonight. We got a lot of stuff going on out there across this country of ours. Let's disconnect for the next three hours, and then you can go back to CNN or whatever you're doing. Deal? Is that a deal? Give me three hours tonight. I promise you'll forget about things for a minute. All right? Is that a deal? I'm looking at Twitter. On a 10-second delay, I'm waiting for everybody to go, you know what, Jimmy, you're right. We're going to unplug for the next three hours. Why? Because we're smart. Let's do this. Let's do this. Podcast all updated. Good. That's the way to support the show. People always, you know, let's donate. But you, know, well, you know what? We're good. But you know what? Subscribe to the podcast. Go over to jimmychurchradio.com. Click on the podcast link. $2. That's it. Let's do this. Podcast is there, man. It is rocking. Okay. We're also going to start doing some uh, special stuff for the podcast, too, as well. I'm thinking about doing a video maybe once a week. Live. What if we just, what if we, bring it down, bring it down. What if we did, uh, what if we did Fader Night on video? Would that be something? It's an idea. What if I just read from a book for two hours on video? (laughs) Something like that. I mean, you know, something unique on video. How can, you know, I was thinking about a Fader Night. Every fader night, we'd shoot a video, but only put that on the podcast. Would that be? Would that be cool? I don't know. And you know, maybe uh, uh, have video sharing. So any callers that called in with uh, Skype that you know capture their video, we could do something like that. I don't know. I don't know. MG just said, "Okay, I'll subscribe. I hope I'll. Rem- I-, I hope I'm a member tomorrow. Do it now, MG. What are you waiting for? As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll put the show on hold. I'll do it right now. Okay, I'm back. But I'll put the show on hold for ten minutes, and then when you come back, I'll let everybody know that you're holding up the show because you haven't subscribed yet. That's. I think that's the way to go. What do you say, huh, Myra?" Go subscribe right now. Do it in real time. And then come back and say, hey, I did it. All right. I don't even know why I just said. Who who posted this? 
Is that Dale? Where'd you get that picture? Let's get cracking. Let me. <laughs> that that is one of the. Oh no! Oh, if you haven't, follow us on Twitter right now at J Church Radio. We got a guy here in a Kraken bib with a big bowl of of crabs. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. I think I know that guy. That's cool. That yeah, that absolutely rocks. That got retweeted. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. And uh what you want to do is hashtag DM Radio Net. All right, let's disconnect tonight. I want to disconnect. Let's disconnect. Last night. I got worn down last night with uh, CNN on here in the studio, and I'm watching our country burn. Ugh. You know, I was just, uh, I felt bad for Lloyd last night because he, he dealt with half of me. He got 50% of what he deserved, and it was just because I had, so that's it. CNN is not on in here tonight. Things have, you know, uh, it, I, I, the only comment that I have to make about all of this is, look, I am all for a nice, rowdy protest. Oh, yeah. Yelling, screaming, getting your voice heard. I'm all down for that. And matter of fact, I'd probably go out there and yell right next to you. I would. But burning down your neighborhood is retarded. That is stupid. Stupid. You get nothing from that. And I don't even think protesters did that. That's just hooligans' stupidity. You know, that's it. Because you get, you gain nothing from that. That's just stupid. I remember uh, driving around Detroit like uh, 20 years ago. Now, 1995, 1996, driving around. And I'm looking, and there are still businesses there that are burnt out from the riots back in the 60s. And they never rebuilt and you drive up and down the street, and you're like, really? They never came back? You know what? And they didn't. The businesses left and said, screw this. You know, and that's what you get. That There's nothing to be gained from that. You know? So, again, I'm all for rowdy protest. <laughs> I am, man. That's, that's what this country is all about. Let's get down. But don't burn down your your neighbor's business just stupid stupid people that work so hard for that and just to have no 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 that's uncool so that's it there's protests going all around uh, the country right now right here in la absolutely uh i was just watching that live before i walked into the studio and and i thought to myself i'm looking at that i'm like you know what no the show must go on let's go do our thing tonight let's have a great time with steven mailer uh, let's have a nice animated conversation. He's great. And I know, I know we're going to have two, two and a half hours with Stephen. That is going to be awesome. So that's it. My frame of mind changed. I'm in here. I'm perked up. I feel good. So let's do this. All right. Are you guys ready? I am talking about disconnect tonight. And that's what we're going to do. Okay. So with that, man, sometimes. If you wind me up and I start heading down that road and I go in the wrong direction, I'm going to go there. So, I just did. All right, I'm back. Today, actress, that's right, Christina Applegate is only 43 years old. 43 years old, Christina Applegate. Man, man, man. I met her when she was like, oh, I'm going to say she was 18. She was 18. She was the coat check girl at a club here in L.A. No joke. <laughs> no joke. I, I think that's what she did. But, uh, yeah, she was like 18 years old. Known her for a long, long time. Actor Jerry Ferreira, who played Turtle on the series Entourage, is 35 years old. He was discovered working at a Boston Market restaurant here in Los Angeles. Famous story around here in L.A. Turtle got the gig, man. Working at a Boston market, and it just, here in L.A., it can happen. And it happened to him. Pretty cool guy, pretty smart guy. Knows the spots, too. Our dead guy's birthday today is John F. Kennedy Jr., born in 1960, died in 1999 at the age of 38, 
He was married to Carolyn Bissett. The couple passed away in a plane crash that also killed Carolyn's sister. I was on uh, with Tim Weisberg the other night on a Spooky South Coast. Great time, by the way. Very professional show. I will always speak so highly of Tim. I really, really dig that guy. Total professional. Good show. And his partners, Matt and Matt in the morning. Pretty cool guys. And we were talking about, uh, I was on the show talking about JFK and the assassination. But one of the things about the man, it just seems like, not Kennedy, the man. I mean, the man, the man, the, the, the guy pulling the puppet strings. Seems like the Kennedy family just got dismantled. I mean, taken apart. They were right there. 40s, 50s, 60s, and then just tragedy brought down Camelot. Unbelievable. John F. Kennedy Jr., 1999, dead at the age of 38 in a plane crash. Hmm. All right. Now, let's have some fun. You guys, you guys want to have some fun? Let's do this. On Twitter right now. Because this started right before the show. So I thought, you know what? That, that's cool. I'm going to change what I was going to say for Twitter tonight to light it up to this. Everybody's favorite. What are your favorite movie quotes ever? The best movie quotes ever. Let's go. Keep it clean. Keep it clean. But what are the best? What are the ones? Because some are so quoted. Here's Johnny. We know that. You know, there, there are some that are quoted all the time. Great picture there, Bob. I like that, Christina. The best movie quotes ever. Man, you got you got your, we were just doing 2001 before the show. You got your Pulp Fiction. You got your Godfather. Uh, There's so many movies, The Shining. There are so many movies that you can just go and quote from. Fast Times at Ridgemont High. You know, so I want to see. The best movie quotes ever. Let's see what we're going. It's already started. I want your favorites. We were watching Fast Times at Ridgemont High the other night, uh, a couple nights ago. I hadn't seen it in a while. And I sat there and I quoted. I was driving Rita nuts. I just, I did the whole movie word for word. She was very patient. I think she wanted to throw a shoe at me after a while. But Damone, Damone is so classic in that. No, I don't got no earth, wind, and fire tickets. Okay, anyway, uh, Twitter, at JChurchRadio. Facebook is uh, Jimmy Church, or I think it's JimmyChurchRadio.com. Everything's fade to black, Jimmy Church. Go go do it. Follow, like, subscribe. If you're on our website right now, all the links are there to follow, like, and subscribe. Come out and hang out in the sandbox. I know I say that. Look, Jeff Krause is in the house tonight. Look at that. Jeffrey coming by. Wow. Wow. Honored. MUFON. Uh, it's MUFON. The MUFON Executive Committee just rolled in. Jeff Krause. Later tonight, we're going to open up the lines with Stephen Mailer. Tomorrow night, uh, Linda Moulton Howe will be with us. We have some. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but let's just say we have some breaking news. And Linda called me up the other day, and we we set aside tomorrow night for her to come by and break this on the show. So we're going to do that tomorrow night with Linda, and she's also said that she wants to hang out. So she is going to do that House of a Thousand Corpses quotes. Michael K., I said, keep it clean. Good movie. Good movie. That shows you where my brain is at. House of a Thousand Corpses. Amazing show. Email throughout the night. Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. You can also go over to the website and get that done. A couple of emails really quick before we get to the break and get to the news. This email is from Anthony. He says, no one has ever asked Larry Haber if the short film is a Hollywood production or the actual departure video Larry Haber has promised in the past. If the short film on Larry Haber's YouTube channel for John Teeter is actually a Hollywood recreation, then this must be a trailer for some sort of John Teeter film. Otherwise, the short film, Who is John Teeter, is actually the departure video and not a movie trailer. Either way, please ask Larry what this short film is. I think Anthony is referencing the, the film with the guy in the living room. I think there's a fish tank. 
and then boom, he's gone. Have you guys seen that? It's pretty cool. This email comes in from Hot Idea about last night's show. Hey, Jimmy, don't leave us hanging. You told us about your mom's writing. You said she never read what she wrote. How about you? Did you ever read anything she wrote? Are you going to? Great question. Again, you need to understand, I was five, six, seven, eight years old when my mom used to do that. And uh, I don't, I remember looking at the stuff. I don't know if I ever read it. Plus, at that age, she wrote in cursive. And uh, she was writing, writing. I don't know if I could have read it, even if I did read it. All I know is I just looked at stacks and stacks and reams of paper. But the question is, does my mom still have it? And that's an interesting question. So I am going to reach out to my mom. I'm going to see if she has anything. Wouldn't that be cool? I'll see if she'll let me read some of that on the air. All right. So thank you for that hot idea because that was a pretty hot idea. This is Fade to Black, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow us right now on Twitter, at JChurchRadio. Hashtag DMRadioNet. That's what you want to do. At JChurchRadio, hashtag DMRadioNet. Come hang out with us. It's right there in front of me right now. Tweet deck. All right, shoot me an email, Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. I'll be back with the headlines that you may not know about. And then Stephen Mailer will join us at the bottom of the hour. Tomorrow night, Linda Moulton Howe for the duration. This is Fade to Black, the spoke radio for the masses. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church fade to black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, you have tuned into the latest phenomenon in late night talk radio, Fade to Black, starring the inimitable Jimmy Church, showcasing his continuing quest in pursuit of knowledge of the strange and paranormal. Sit back, open your mind, and let's get cracking. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I gotta tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three-letter. So, seriously, give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444 1-877-909-5444 or go check out their website www.nattaxexperts.com that's n-a-t-t-a-x-e-x-p-e-r-t-s dot com tell them Jimmy sent you this is KJCR at jimmychurchradio.com on the Dark Matter Radio Network <laughs> I got to tell you, this is Fade to Black, by the way, because Spoke Radio for the Masses. We are only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Shoot me an email, Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Follow us on Twitter at JChurchRadio. That is what you want to do. Hashtag DM Radio Net. I could sit here and read these movie quotes for the next two hours. Awesome stuff. I mean, uh, uh, right now, I, I don't know who... Who's got the best one, but uh, I got to say, 
uh, uh, Michael Anderson with his Blues Brother stuff here. I, you know, I had forgotten a lot of this. They've got scamods. Oh, good stuff. I mean, seriously. So I could sit here and read this all night. Adrian. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, movie quotes, man. I just love them. And some of that, you know what, though? Nobody, unless I'm missing it here. Nobody has done uh, anything from Pulp Fiction. That's kind of weird. I mean, we got Buckaroo Banzai here. You know, we've got uh, a lot of uh, AC-35 unit, a lot of uh, 2001. Really cool stuff, but nobody did. Uh, I'm kind of surprised. Kind of surprised about that. Okay. All right. Yeah, here's Michael Anderson right here. I bet they've got SCMOD, State County Municipal Offender Data Systems. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Let's go. Let's get to the let's get to these headlines. All right. Today, Ferguson officer Darren Wilson told ABC that he was sorry for the loss of Michael Brown's life, but that his conscience was clear. Quotes from the interview. One of them is I did my job right and I have a clean conscience. OK. All right. We weren't there. Uh, so much conflicting eyewitness testimony. Uh, the only people that really knows Michael Brown and, and, and Darren Wilson. And we have to leave it at that. The grand jury spoke. Now, now the country is responding to that. Hopefully we'll just keep it all peaceful. Okay. We don't need, we don't, we don't need anybody hurt. Thank goodness. Nothing went down like that last night. Just, uh, just burning property and stuff like that. But thank goodness. All right. Uh, let's see here. I just heard something in my headphones, and I'm just wondering. Uh, that I think I need to mute something, and I will do that right now. Hold on. Let me do that. Let me close. That's done. Okay. All right. Moving on. HBO is backing a documentary based on Going Clear, a book about Scientology and Hollywood. That's right. I hate saying that word. Not Hollywood. And it isn't taking any chances with the legal side of things. That's why I hate saying that other word. Hate it. Hate it. Hate it. Man, that come down on you like a hammer. We probably have 160 lawyers. HBO Documentary Films President Sheila Nevins told The Hollywood Reporter, yes, we probably, this is a quote, we probably have 160 lawyers, as opposed to that other word who has got, you know, 5,000. But they're going to do it. They're going to move forward. It's based on a book called Going Clear. And you know what? I've already said that other word enough. I said it once. I, I went out on a limb so we're going to let that go. The U.S. Navy, I don't know if you've seen this video. I have. The U.S. Navy is testing a laser weapon right now in the Gulf designed to shoot down drones. I've seen the video. I'm going to say this. Star Wars is officially here. Oh, yeah. Now, to have a laser weapon on a on a cruiser or a destroyer or missile, you know, whatever you want to call uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, any one of those small ships. They have some a laser weapon on it like that, and to say that it's there to shoot down drones, well, you can shoot at whatever you want. Think about that. How about, now, it's effective up to 10 miles away. The video that I saw of them shooting down this plane, it's a real, it's a real video, it's not an animation. And the video, it is crazy. This thing just starts to heat up and then catch on fire, and then that's it, right? Well, what if you're one of those it, it, 10 miles away? Now, the horizon, 12 miles, right? The edge of the ocean. So you're out there. What if you're one of those doofuses, one of those pirates, one of those little wooden boats trying to... <laughs> <laughs> just all of a sudden it starts getting warm <laughs> you could use that you could use that thing for anything and it's a crazy it's, it's here Star Wars is here 
that that can be used on anything. Now, when it comes to you know shooting down planes and I mean fighter jets and things like that, well, we have heat seeking missiles and so forth and all of that. You know, that's that's we have that technology pretty well dialed. But as far as some kind of anti ship missile or something coming in where we use Gatlin guns and, and other things for, but this thing, it's it's a laser. So it's pretty cool. But I was thinking drones, okay, all right, I get that. Anti ship missiles, okay, makes sense. But one of those little wooden pirate ships, that's where the fun is at. <laughs> Man, my mind is bad. It's so bad. Scientists from the European Space Agency, that's right, ESA, now say that filet may revive itself. The final resting place of filet, as I reported last week, didn't allow enough sunlight to fall on the solar panels, so the batteries ran down. 48 hours worth of power. Some said 60, some said 48. Doesn't matter. It was able to complete its original mission, uh, just like I talked about last night, until it died. But before Filet closed down, engineers managed to rotate the probe so a larger solar panel would be exposed to sunlight, and they believe this will be enough to automatically restart the spacecraft when the comet's orbit takes it closer to the sun. Now, do you think you think they're reporting that now because of the 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 negative the negative uh, press that they received from this forty eight hours worth of battery power, and now suddenly it's different. You know, hey, 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 we we got this. We happened to right before. Well, okay, all right, we'll see, we'll see. They happen to just have a larger solar panel. You know, yeah. I'll buy into that. Check this out. This is a good one. Twitter CFO. Always remember, always remember, everybody out there, always remember, don't make a mistake when you tweet. When you tweet, doesn't matter who you are. When you tweet, that stuff stays a little permanent. And by the time you want to admit your mistake and you want to go out there and pull that stuff down and delete it, somebody's already copied it. Think about that for a second. I do. Because I'm stupid. And i uh, that's why I don't tweet that much. That's why I don't post that much stuff on Facebook. Because I like to have fun. And what if, just what if, right? I just took it one step too far. Or I, I did a funny tweet to one of my friends and I just didn't think of it. And then the next thing you know. And it's not like you have to be somebody. It doesn't. But what if your boss reads it? Or what if a potential employer sees something on Facebook? You know, you always got to be careful. But the one guy out there, and his name's Anthony Noto, the one guy out there that should know how to deal with Twitter, messed up. And that is the CFO of Twitter, Anthony Noto. He accidentally tweeted a message that he intended to send privately. That's what he says. That's right. The tweet said this, and I'm quoting. I, I, I still think we should buy them. He is on your schedule for December 15th or 16th. We will need to sell him. I have a plan. That's the tweet. And that's not a good one. And if you think about it, it's easy to pick apart and figure out exactly who he's talking about. And he's the CFO of Twitter. He went and deleted the tweet. But by that time, it had already been retweeted, copied, posted, and it was all over the net in seconds. And now, apparently, they know exactly who he was talking about. <laughs> the one guy. The one guy. So I'm just saying, I'm going to give everybody advice. Just be careful. Just before. It may be witty. It may be funny. It may be that. Maybe that. Maybe it's probably. Just be careful. It just doesn't matter. 
Because by the time you take it back, want to take it, but whatever it is that you want to take back, it'll be too late. Seconds is too long. So before you hit that tweet button, for me, you see my tweets. Hey, here we go. <laughs> That's my tweet. Everybody here? That's my tweet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I need to behave. I'm doing my best. All right, you guys ready? You ready for Stephen Mailer? If you have a story, something that you want covered on Fade to Black, send it right here, www.jimmychurchradio.com. You can send it right through the website. Tweet us at jchurchradio. Find us on Facebook, jimmychurchradio.com. When we come back after the break, Stephen Mailer. Tomorrow, Linda Moulton Howe. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us. Are you afraid of the dark? Don't move. Don't touch that mouse. You are listening to Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses, on jimmychurchradio.com. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark matter. You're listening to Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is a revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. We are only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow us on Twitter right now, eight, at eight, <laughs> at J Church Radio, hashtag DM Radio Net. I was just going to say the call-in number is 323-825-5045. We're going to open up the phone lines. Oh, I'm going to guess and say 90 minutes. We'll leave that up to uh, Stephen. Uh, if he wants to take calls and I, you know what, it's my guess. Steven is going to want to talk to everybody, but we'll see because I have also the feeling that Steven and I are going to pack five hours of conversation <laughs> into the next two hours. So we may not have time for calls, but we'll see how that goes. And I am ready. Let's get this crack. And Steven Mailer's fascination with ancient e Egypt guided his educational and spiritual work all of his life. Mailer holds three degrees in the sciences and is a trained field archaeologist and prehistorian. Mailer also served as a staff research scientist for the Rosicrucian Order, AMORC, in San Jose, California, from 1978 to 1980. For almost 16 years, Mailer was a student, disciple, and close friend of Egyptian-born Egyptologist and wisdom keeper Hakim. Stephen has written two books, The Land of Osiris, uh, and From Light into Darkness, The Evolution of Religion in Ancient Egypt, based on his work with Hakim and over 40 years of research. He is currently the Director of Research of, of the Land of Osiris Research Project. Mailer has researched the Crystal Skull since 1979 and has written a book on the subject with David Hatcher Childress, The Crystal Skull's Astonishing Portals to Man's Past, Tonight, Brian Forrester couldn't join us. He had some internet issues down there in Peru. But you know what? It doesn't matter. We don't need Brian. We just need Stephen. How are you tonight, Stephen? I'm fine, Jimmy, and it's great to finally talk to you on the air. Uh, it's great to finally have you on the air. And, you know, like I you know, Brian, Brian, he, he's on too many radio shows. <laughs> 
He's a <laughs> well, I'll tell you, he's a hot commodity, and for a good reason. And I just had the very good fortune of spending two weeks in September on tour with Brian and his wonderful wife Irene uh, in Peru and Bolivia, and we can talk about that a lot tonight. Too. Yeah, we will. I- I'll tell you a funny story, really quick, before we kick things off. Uh, uh, over a year ago, when we were setting up the show. Uh, we sat around the producers here and a couple of friends of mine, you may or may not know Steve Murillo and Wolf McCarron, Steve Murillo from MUFON, uh, Wolf McCarron from MUFON. And we were sitting around with our producers sitting around, uh, had a list. Uh, we started to compile a list of guests that we were going to, you know, book over the next three months. Mm. I, I'm not kidding. Two of the names that came up in the first paragraph of the first production meeting was Brian Forrester and Stephen Mailer. I'm honored. Yeah, and and Brian Forrester, and he was always there. You were always that. You two guys were always there, and it was just one of those things. I couldn't figure out how to get a hold of Brian because he was down in South America, and every time I looked at your two schedules, you guys were always out of country. Mm-hmm. I, and I had the same problem with Jaws, you know, James Anthony West, and the same mm-hmm. thing with Shock. You know, you guys are always out having a good time. It's us working, you know, schmoes. <laughs> I got to do this every night. You guys are in Giza. You're in Peru. You're in well, Bolivia. You, especially, especially Brian, because he's continually doing tours. And, and uh, you know, we'll discuss that before the evening's over and give out his site because um, he has full tours of many people, 30 people, 40 people, 50 people, some small tours, 10, 15 people. Some people just come in couples, six people, five people, three people. And uh, he will lead them around. And he... Um, he has dual dual citizenship. I mean, he lives there now in two two different towns. I mean, in Paracas and in uh, Cusco. Right. And so uh, there's nobody knows the areas in Cusco and the Sacred Valley better than he does. Well, you you know what? I'm going to tell you one of my little. I have a couple of favorite things that I do every night. One of them, Oreo cookies and milk at about two a.m. after the show. Okay, I'm serious. I'm in bed. I got my stack of Oreo cookies. I got my milk. You know what my other favorite thing to do is? And I'm not I'm not blowing smoke is watching videos of you two guys uh, on your tours and Thank watching. I, I do it all the time. I, I, I can quote some <laughs> you and Dendera, I, any, it doesn't matter. I can quote, <laughs> I can quote all that stuff. But, but the way that you two guys um, handle not only Hakeem's son and, and how the three of you communicate to the people that are on the tours or the way that you guys talk amongst yourselves – and it's like being there. It's like I'm taking my own tour. You guys always have good cameras and good audio. And it's like being there. And I do it all the time. And I relish the moment. I can't wait when a new video gets posted. And and that's what I do. Okay. All right. That's my secret. That's great. That's my, okay. My The, the man love is out there. <laughs> Everybody knows now. But I, I enjoy it so much. And thank you for uh, for what you do. Well, again, and you've pinpointed it already, and we'll discuss it in more, more detail. The, the reason I am able to do that is because of the man, and what we do is dedicated to him. Abdel Hakim Awiyan was the full name. Everybody knew him as Hakim. As I've mentioned to you, there are many famous names we could throw out that used him as a tour guide, particularly in the 80s and 90s, and actually that's when uh, tourism for Americans used, peaked in the 90s. We haven't since 2001 gone back to Egypt in numbers that were before that. But Hakim used to lead groups with Barbara Han Clow, with John Anthony West, with uh, Greg Braden, and uh, uh, he was a personal guide to Henry Kissinger, <laughs> to, to the late Tom Bradley, the mayor of uh, Los Angeles, who was once governor of California, et cetera, et cetera. So it was being in the field with him and learning at his knee for 16 precious years that I'm able to do anything. And, and to repeat this and to, and to see a, a, a picture that he posted, that he laid out for us that was totally different and was being taught in academic Egyptology or even academic art archaeology, mm-hmm. a whole different idea. And he laid the concept out to me early in the 90s. It's now 22 years ago, and in November of 1992, and it was 15 years that I was planning to go. I was ready to go to Egypt in the 70s. You know, my story goes back to when I'm eight years old and had a vision with the Sphinx, and the Sphinx has been guiding me all my life, as he said. And so uh, 
it, she led me to him. And there it was. And it, 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 all these famous people, and I heard his name first in 1987. I just told that to someone recently. Uh, I was again involved with this Crystal Skull research, and I was involved in the San Francisco Whole Life Expo in 1987. And I met these folks from a company called Power Places Tours, which was one of the first groups that was leading tours to Egypt on a spiritual or metaphysical vein. And, uh, you know, I met these two wonderful people, Harry and Ruth Hover, and she is gone now, bless her memory. And they were telling me about this guide that they used. And they said, you know, he's one of these old wisdom keepers. He's one of these guys who knows the old ways. I said, really? And the name just hit me, Hakim. And so I knew that I had to go and meet this man. And, you know, eventually, as things happened, a series of events occurred. In 1992, I was able to go. And the first day on tour, he was. Le- I met a group with Nikki Scully. And Nikki Scully is a whole other story that we could go on for hours about because she's probably led the most tours to Egypt of any American. That's she right. She first went to Egypt in 1978 with the, with the Grateful Dead. And this is a whole other story which your listeners may love to want to hear. Um, she was married to Rock Scully, who was the publicist for the Grateful Dead. And That's so the right. Grateful Dead made arrangements to have a concert in uh, Egypt. I don't know if you're, any listeners are old enough to remember that. They set up a platform in front of the Sphinx, gave out some wonderful concerts, free concerts to the Egyptians in 1978. So... As would happen, she was going along with them, as probably they did, knowing Jerry Garcia and the group, as I probably can understand, they would probably say to somebody, who's the wisest man around? We want to go to who's, you know, who's the, who knows the secret, who's the wise guy? And they said, oh, go right down the street from the Sphinx. It's the house of Abdel Hakim. And so they went in his house. So this is, I tell so many Hakim stories, you know, we could go on for hours with just Hakim stories, but this is one of my favorite. So years ago, maybe around 2006, 2007, around 2006, I'm talking to Hakim and I'm saying, you know what, they all said, you know, the Grateful Dead were here now, I'm in his house smoking shisha with him. For people who don't know what the shisha is, it's the pipe that they smoke, it's a water pipe, what everybody considers a hookah, usually smoked with tobacco, but of course mixed with hashish in Egypt. And so I asked him, um, I said, you had the Grateful Dead here in the house? He said, oh, yes. So I paused and I looked at, I looked at him and I used to call him Papa. And I said, Papa, you smoke shisha with Jerry Garcia? <laughs> and, he, and he said to me, you mean the guitar player? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, forget about Hakeem and, and Jerry Garcia. What about you and Hakeem? Did you do a little shh with uh, Hakeem yourself? Oh, that's how the teachings go. And, you know, oh, and, and, right on. And I happen to live in Colorado now, so we can talk about it legally. <laughs> I mean, yes. Uh, no, this is a tradition long before there was tobacco. Tobacco was introduced into Egypt by the Mameluk Turks, Turks who grow tobacco, in the 16th century. Before then, they didn't smoke tobacco. They just primarily smoked hashish. And we have uh, in history, if you understand uh, um, why the Knights Templars, one of the main reasons they originally went to the Holy Land was not just to liberate Jerusalem from the uh, Muslims, which is the pretext that the Pope sent them there. No, they went to connect with the mystical secret orders of Islam, of the mystery groups of their day. And they, they met connected with a group who were known as the Assassins. It was actually the Ismaili sect of, of Sunni Islam at this time. This is now we're talking about the 12th century, 11th century, when the, the first crusades. And the Knights Templars go over and learn the secrets of war from the Assassins. Now, supposedly, Assassin comes from Hashishin. That supposedly, before they would go into battle, they would smoke a whole lot of Hashish, and it would dull their senses or make them oblivious to that. But what really the secret of the Assassins were is that in, instead of sending armies to fight long, prolonged, bloody wars, they would make arrangements to kill the leaders of their enemies, of the groups. An assassination, assassin. That's where the assassin came from. The word comes from that, from hashishin. They'd smoke a lot of hashish, they'd secretly go in the night and kill the leader of that rival group, and there'd be no war. So it wouldn't cost a lot of lives. So the Knights Templars learned that from the group. That's one of the reasons they went to the Holy Land. I know we're getting off the subject, but you asked about that. And yet, well, you know, it's a very ancient tradition. What Hakim would use it as shamans always use it, as a tool. Sure. Now, he, he, is, he was addicted to it, so he's going to smoke it. He would invite anybody into the house. He would ask you if you wanted to take part, you could take part. Men, women, again, his house was not a typical 
Muslim house. Women were as equal, if not superior. He lived in a matriarchal understanding. That's the understanding that we teach ancient Kemet was. Hakim lived his life that way as an adult man. His family was a matriarchy. And so he came up to a matriarchal through his mother's side of the family. His last name, Awiyan, was not his father's name. Actually, on his passport, it was Abdel Hakim Awiyan Hassan. Hassan was his father's name. But when he came into manhood and understood what the ancient commission society, the culture that we talk about, who built the pyramids and carved the Sphinx, which was a matriarchy, he changed his life that way. And so his daughters and his wife ran the household. And so he, he lived in a matriarchal life. And so he, he actually changed that way. And uh, uh, I forgot where I was going. Well, but oh, yeah. I think, course, I think you the just... Subject of, of the fact that uh, uh, hashish has been smoked in Egypt for at least thousands of years, at least. Well, I think we just figured out how hashish made its way to Amsterdam. But um bum but um bum Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, okay, let's back up because you had just mentioned you had a vision of the Sphinx when you were uh, uh, eight years old. Well, basically, it was at that time, my, to my mother's blessed memory, and I'm talking, I'll date myself, I grew up in the early 50s, um, she had around the house the two great pictorial magazines of the day, which was Life Magazine and National Geographic. So I, one of the clearest memories I have, again, around the age of eight, is opening up a mag- uh, issue of National Geographic and seeing a picture of the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx. And it hit me deep to the core of my being. At that age, I could not articulate what was happening. I could not even understand what was happening. But I know now an unconscious connection was made between the Sphinx and me. And so the Sphinx has guided me on this whole path from that age. Not immediately did I wake up the next morning and say, oh, I'm going to become an Egyptologist. Nothing of the sort. But what did lead me then was to reject the, the systems of thought that were given to me, religion, parents, education, school, no, didn't work. And I decided, well, okay, I'm going to reject religion, which I did around the age of 13. And then I decided to go, the sciences, the sciences, that's objective truth. It must be science that will give me the answers. Mm-hmm. And so I went into the sciences, but then I found out the sciences were another system of belief with paradigms and controls and all that. It wasn't exactly what I thought it would be. And I went into mysticism. And, and spirituality, which led me eventually to the path the Sphinx was guiding me all the way. So as I, I mentioned, I go into detail in my books, certain events happen in our lives, which of course put us on the path. When we get to a certain age, we can look back and say, wow, if it wasn't for that teacher, if it wasn't for that person, right. if it wasn't for that book right. that fell into my lap, right. my, lap would, my life would be so different. So it was a series of books and it was a series of teachers, Hakim being the last and the greatest. When you first, after all, you know, your your life takes you down all those crazy roads from when you were eight, seeing the, the, the Sphinx, and then you finally get to Giza, and the first time you saw the Sphinx, did you did you cry? I mean, yeah, was it well, a moving? Yeah, I cried before I went into the Great Pyramid, too, the first time. Sure. They, I, I always tell this story, and I used to tell this story when we would do lectures together, because I knew he would laugh at this. I'd say the first day, I'm out there with a group with Nicky Scully. It was Power Places Tour in November 1992. We had to meet on the Giza Plateau, and I hadn't met him before this. And there's the first day he's standing in front of the Sphinx, the first time I saw him. And I looked at him, and I looked at her, and her is the key opportunity word, and we'll explain in detail for your listeners why it's a she, not a he, and that's why it's a matriarchal civilization, but I'm looking at her, looking at him, and, 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 and I always would joke and say, I couldn't tell which one was older, because he had this face that had the wisdom of a million years, and he would laugh when I would say that when he was in his presence, but then the Sphinx said to me, right directly then, she said, this is him, this is the man you've been looking for all your life, this is your teacher, he is my son, and that was it. And then I would die on every word he said. I would take notes of what he was saying. I tried to video, audio record things he was saying. And key phrases he would say banged into my head. Because at this time, 1992, I've already been a Rosicrucian. I've already been on the spiritual path myself since the late 60s. I've gone through a lot of different systems, a lot of different gurus and teachers, blah, 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 blah. And I'm listening to him, key things he's saying, the way he would use English phrases. I said to myself immediately, this man is not a Muslim. He's not a normal Okay, he's going on and on. He would say, my teachers would say this, my teachers would say that. 
okay. And then he would make clearly, we, we would go around and he would take us in the museum and show all the matriarchal things and point out it was a matriarchy. And I had already come to that point. My second master's degree is in social sciences, but it was actually in women's studies at San Jose State University in the late 70s, 1978, where I had discovered myself that ancient Egypt was a matriarchy. And I put on a couple of hour, five hour presentation in front of the women's studies department pointing out all the women who had ruled Egypt that the word pharaoh didn't even mean the male ruler and Hakim gave us that teaching that the word comes from per ah the Greeks made it far ah they looked, the Greeks came in and only saw fathers and sons. They were patriarchal. So they saw kings and their sons. That's what they thought the civilization was about. And so they put the word phareo, meaning the male head of the ruler. But it actually meant the high house, the woman's house. And so there were never any male pharaohs. That's one of our basic teachings. Everybody has used the word incorrectly, including myself. There never were any male pharaohs. We could say there was the male head of the household. That's the person who's being depicted in the tombs. And it's later and later, we can go into the whole detail how this system evolves. But Hakim was always accentuated in matriarchy, matriarchy. So immediately I had to grab him on the side after the museum tour. And I said, listen, I have to ask you something. Yes, yes. And I said, I'm looking for this tradition oral tradition, are you part of it? And yes. And then I said, I read this book by Murray Hope, a British uh, occultist and, and Egyptologist who wrote about keeping the oral tradition still alive in Egypt. And he said, yes, you come. And then uh, the first time I came to his house in 1992 was in a taxi cab with Barbara Hanclow. Well, how much, how much has been handed down from Hakim to his son? Great question. And he taught he was an incredible teacher because he never pushed it on his children. He was totally unique in that we have, we, again, he covered both schools. As a young child, you know, to give his story is really important because he starts around the age of six. He's chosen by a male an uncle on his mother's side, his mother's brother. Again, it's his mother's family that he identified strongly with. He was chosen, his favorite uncle was an uncle named Zaki, who chose him at the age of six to be a wisdom keeper, to learn the tradition of his family. It was a tradition of his family to know these secrets. His oral tradition had been passed down for thousands of years. So at the age of six, he was sent to a Sufi master. And the Sufi master made him at the age of six memorize the Quran. Now listen again to what I'm saying. Not to study it, not to be able to argue it, to memorize it. He knew every chapter, verse, every surah, as it said, every phrase every jot, every period, every comma. Why? Because then the Sufi master would take him beyond Islam. He had to know the Quran backwards and forwards. He had to know all the basis of Islam taught by a master, then to go into the deeper spirituality, to go past it. Because the original Sufis, as Hakim taught, were way before Islam. They were the ones who knew the oral secrets going back to ancient Kemet. That's where the word Suf, Sufi comes from. We actually said that the ancient way to speak of the language, which the Greeks called hieroglyphics, which means sacred signs, eroglyphica, was, he called it, the Suf language. Can you, read, Suf. Hiero, can you read hieroglyphics, by the way? I can partially read it. His son, his son Yusuf can read it almost as well as Hakim can, and there was nobody in the world who could read him like Hakim could. Yeah, I've tried to I've tried to teach myself and tried to learn. I gave up. <laughs> I can go through some phrases, I can recognize certain things. I can recognize certain key things that are that what what's being said on the walls. He taught me how to read them though, where they are on the walls, where they are positioned in a temple, each is it has meaning what's written if only certain groups could see. So it's a whole hierarchy of understanding. The only the common people who could not read and write, they could only stand outside the temples. So they would only see the scenes, the pictures that were on the walls outside sure. the temples. Sure. Each level of priest could read a certain level going into only the highest priests, priestesses could go to what we call the Holy of Holies or to where the secrets were kept. But even again, Hakim as an oral wisdom teacher, and I just want to continue how he went as he became an oral teacher. He, he, his teacher was named Ismail, but he also had a title called Zen Nar. Nar means fire, so it was the fire of Zen. Now, Zen is a word that's usually a Sanskrit word. It comes from an Asian tradition, which means meditation. However, Hakim said the word Zen, Asian word, Sanskrit word, comes from an ancient Kamishan word, Zim, which meant consciousness. Meditation leads to consciousness. So there's a title that we put on Hakim, which I give him, called uh, Abu, Abu Zen, which means, because 
Zahi Huas, who we can talk about tonight, who's the director of the Giza Plateau for many years and was an enemy of Hakim in many ways, but never would confront him directly, would use a title that they would criticize Hakim as the father of meditation. Again, Hakim was the first tour guide in Egypt who led groups in the 80s and even as far back as the late 70s to the sites and taught them to meditate at the sites. Not just tell you the garbage that's on the walls or what's in the books, what's this, what's that, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. He used both sides of the brain. So this is what you're seeing when you see the videos of us in the field because Yusuf works the same way as his father taught him. Uh, uh, he, t- he taught from both sides of the brain. You have to experience it as well as get an intellectual understanding. And that's what we try to do. And so he learned that, and he learned that himself. What he did was then as a man, he went around all the sites in Egypt, and he met the old men in his day. He met when he was a boy of the teens, 15, 18. He met men that were in their 80s and 90s at each site who kept the secrets of each site. He went around all the sites of Egypt, and he put it together, and he saw that there was a system that the oral tradition was talking about an ancient system, and this is what we have brought to the world as chemitology, that there was a previous civilization before what we call dynastic Egypt, which comes around 3000 BCE, 5,000 years ago, that this civilization was over 10,000 years ago, and they built the pyramids not as tombs, but as machines. They carved the sphinx, and they built these incredible temples, and they used water and sound and crystal in ways that we're just learning about today. Day. And so he, he laid out this whole structure for us, and that was the system. I'm the only one that put the label on it. I labeled it. I said, let's call it chemitology, because we're creating something that's opposed to Egyptology. Sure. And Hakim loved it, because one of his favorite sayings was, if you don't like the system, create your own. When he walked around Giza, it was nothing but respect. Ultimate. Ultimate. The village that he lived, which again is the village right next to the Giza Plateau, is known as Nazlet es Samam. Nazlet means village. Samam was a Bedouin sheik. When they started making these villages was when the British were in control of Egypt, say in the 1880s, 1870s, and so they would bring in these sheiks. They start, were starting to make to start to make a civilization to have cities in control. So they would name the villages after a sheik. So this was Samam. So the village is called Nazlet es Samam. Well. Up when he became into manhood, Hakim was known as sort of the unofficial mayor of the village. But as he got older, of course, and I, again, I knew him for 16 years, I first saw this respect in 1992. I saw he was the most respected of all tour guides. The, even the antiquities police would stop traffic so he could walk across the traffic, he could mm-hmm. walk across the street. Mm-hmm. I saw many, many signs of ultimate respect from other guides and from the people around the area. As he got older... I noticed a whole new generation of younger guys came in, trained by Zahi Hawass, who didn't have that respect as much. But it was always there until the end of his days, when even at his funeral, it was a great event and all this and all that. You know, he passed in August of 2008, and uh, um, is age of 82. And also, I gave another title for him, and I want you, this for people to understand. We called him the last of the Dragoman. It's also a word that can be looked up. It's spelled many different ways. People who speak the Turkish language say, I don't recognize that word. It's also called Turkoman. Dragoman, Dragoman. What the Dragoman was, was the last great Muslim empire that we had before ISIS or ISIL is trying to make another one, was known as the Ottoman Empire. It was the Turks, based in Turkey. That's why Turkey today is still some of the most source of the most extremist Muslims, not in necessarily in Saudi Arabia or even in Yemen or even in Pakistan. It's in Turkey because that's where the last empire was, the Ottoman Empire. Well, the Dragoman would be the second in, in charge next to the Pasha, the Sultan. And so he was the person that was, usually he, of course, it's a Muslim culture, but he was the most educated, would know many different languages would know not only Islam, of course, but would know Christianity and Judaism and could converse in that, would know the archaeological sites, would lead wealthy people or or notables around the site. So that was the kind of person that Hakim was. He was a dragoman. Again, he could speak at least seven languages that I know of. He could not only read and write in, in, in Arabic, of course, he could read and write in English, he could read and write in German, he could read and write in Dutch. He actually did graduate school in archaeology. Again, he went on and became academic. He had he had dual degrees in archaeology and Egyptology from Wad, Wad University in 1952. He graduated at his today Cairo University. So he was academically trained. He did graduate work at, at the Leiden University in Holland, could speak fluent Dutch, fluent German. Again, I saw him interviewed in German. And he could fake it in Japanese. He could fake it in all the other different languages that were around, at least seven fluently. And so 
and again, nobody understood the ancient Commission language like he did. So nobody could read the glyphs as well as he did. But he came upon this his own way by going to all the sites, talking to all the teachers, bringing it together into the system. So you asked how he taught his children. Well, he had 11 children. He had eight sons and three daughters. He never forced any of it on any of them. He would talk to them. He would speak to them. He he brought up his, his children as a, as in a commission household, matriarchal. That uh, uh, he, there was not to be this great, you know, push to go to the mosque or to learn Islam. He always said to them, "If you want to become Muslim, go to the mosque. It's okay." He said, "If you don't want to, that's okay too. You don't have to." Because he didn't. The only time he went to the mosque was to argue with the imams. But that's another story. So, I mean, so he didn't force it on his children. So all his children, did, none of them really followed directly in his path. Again, he went and he did it academically. He had degrees in archaeology and Egyptology. That's why nobody knew Egyptology as well as he did and why he could go past it again. And so his, his children would listen. And when I came around from 1992 on, that you know, his sons, like Yusuf, who's now there, would listen to our discussions, but never really joined in. He never forced them to go to school. If you want to go to school, he would tell them, learn to read and write. It's important. And he would tell them, learn to read and write English. Not all of them did. They all speak English fluently because his house was an international hostel. From the 1960s to his passing to this day forward, people from all around the world come through that house house. And so they heard all these different languages. So they were heard many, many different English speakers growing up. So they all can speak English fluently, but not many of them took his advice to read it as well as he could. And so none of them went to school. None of them went on to become degrees. None of them became credential archaeologists, Egyptologists. His daughter went one school one day, the archaeology school, and, she, and the, the, the teacher started saying this and that. His, daughter, his eldest daughter's name is Shehrazad, and, and uh, uh, the teacher would say to her, what do you, and she would argue with the teacher, say, no, it's this and that. And she would say, who, who are you? And she would say her last name, Awiyan. She'd say, your father's Hakim? And she'd, and she'd say, yes. He said, get out of my class. And so, and the same thing with Yusuf. He never went to school. He never listened. He, he, he listened to the tour guides, and he would hear that they were telling this garbage all the time. He'd listen to what his father was saying, and his father would always say, go out and look for yourself. Learn it for yourself. And one day, Yusuf came home in the house, and he tells this story today that he would often go out on the Giza Plateau. Of course, they live right there. And he would follow the tour groups around. And he would listen to what the guides were saying. And they'd say the same garbage every day, the same thing. And he'd come home and his father would say to him, sit down, tell me what you do today. He said, I went out on the plateau and I followed the tour groups around. And his father said, that's it? And he'd say, yeah. Said, okay, nothing else. One day, Yusuf said, he went out and he said, I'm tired of listening. It's the same crap every day. And he went off on his own. And he discovered the stone. And he discovered this. And he looked at this. And he came home and his father said, sit down, tell me what you did today. And he sat down and he said, what would you do? I said, well, I went away from the tour groups. I didn't want to hear it anymore. And I looked over there and he, and he said, now let's talk. Yeah, and that, that's when he took the turn and he was ready. Yeah, you know, the, the torch was passed. This and is especially when his father passed away. When his father passed in 2008, in 2009, Yusuf went from a boy and became a man. Absolutely. And he decided to follow his father's path completely, and he is his own man because he's a stone carver. He knows stone as well as anybody. He's learned to read the glyphs by himself. His father didn't teach him. He read his father's books. He went to all through his father's old books in Arabic from the Egyptian Egyptologists like Ahmed Fakhri and Salim Hassan, who were way before Hawass, who were much more honest in their research and did some of the original excavations in the 30s and 40s, and Yusuf read all these books. And in the last two years, he's become a scholar, and he's unbelievable in the field. And that's what you can see when you see these videos. He is his father's son, and yet he is his own man. This is Fade to Black, Bespoke Radio for the Masses. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We are talking with Stephen Mailer. Stephen, I want to, uh, uh, let's change gears a little bit, and let's uh, let's go south on a subject. Uh, it's Zahi Haiwas. Do, yeah. you, do you think... Zahi, uh, this week, uh, uh, the prosecutor over in Cairo has, has said that he needs to come in and answer some questions. Oh, yeah, there's charges against him. Again. There's some charges against him. Do you think he'll return to Egypt, or do you think uh, he's gonna, it's best that he just stays away? Oh, no, he's in Egypt. Oh, he's back. Oh, he's in Egypt. He's always been... 
since 2011, since he was deposed, when Mubarak was deposed, he was always identified with Mubarak, and rightly so, because it was Hosni Mubarak and his wife Suzanne who actually put Hawass in power. I mean, it's a long story. No one knew more about Zahi Hawass than Hakim did. Sure. Because Hakim followed his whole career, from when he first started as an inspector in, in the Delta, working in the 70s after he'd gotten his degree. And, and there's the whole story of how he was pushed through school. I mean, this is a, it's a long story. We could do three-hour show, four-hour show about Hawass, how he was chosen by, Amer- you know, we can get into conspiracy theorists here. He was chosen by, by people high in American government and Egyptian government to be their man. He was put, he was not a, not a, uh, an admirable student at all in Egypt, but all of a sudden he winds up at Penn State University in a doctoral program in Egyptology, and he's pushed through. He suddenly gets great grades, and you know he's really not a scholar at all. I know the man. I've met the man. I've sat and sat with the man, and so um, his his doctoral degree was in Greco-Roman Egyptology. It wasn't even Old Kingdom, but so he starts out as an inspector in the Delta. What he, and I'm going to tell this on the air. Again, we talked about this. I don't care how this gets out because I've said this on the air before. Hakim told me this story many years ago. How Zahi Hawa started his career was a minor inspector at a site in the Delta, which is north of Cairo. There are a lot of sites there. And there were cemeteries there. And they were digging up and finding what are called Ushaptis. When the Egyptians buried somebody, they had a nice little game going, and, and we can discuss that. That's really discussed in detail in my second book, How Religion Became the first business, not prostitution. Prostitution is not the oldest business of, of human beings. It's religion and death, around death, and how it all started that made a business out of it. So how they would do in Egypt is the wealthier you, you were, the more Ushaptis you could have in your tomb. What's a Ushapti? It would be a little image made out of different materials, depending how wealthy you were, mostly out of faience, which is a, a sort of a clay that's put a, green, a copper blue glaze on it. And it would be an image of you, yourself. And it would be, if people can relate to it, it's like indulgences in the Catholic Church. A Yushapti would speak for one of your sins on the other side. So, of course, if you were a sinful person and you were pretty wealthy, there would be hundreds of Yushaptis in your tomb. Of course, the, the so-called kings and the royal tombs had hundreds and not thousands of Yushaptis in them. So what Hawass found was in the early 70s, a lot of so-called hippies were coming to Egypt from Europe from America, and they would pay money for you Shaptis. So, Zahi Huwas, for all the world to hear me tonight, started his career selling antiquities in the early 70s, selling you Shaptis to tourists. But all of a sudden, he seems to move up the ranks very quickly. He had people in high places, people connected with him. When, when Mubarak takes over after the assassination of uh, Sadat in 1981, mm-hmm. which is now almost undeniable proof that Mubarak was involved in the assassination of Anwar Sadat. Uh, Sadat comes into power, I mean, Mubarak comes into power, and Zahi rises quickly. And all of a sudden, Suzanne Mubarak, the wife of Hosni Mubarak, is going around wearing what we call pharaonic jewelry. Jewelry that comes from tombs. Where did she get it from? Zahi Hawass. Mm. All of a sudden, he moves up quickly. He then becomes director of the Giza Plateau and Saqqara. That's just through the 80s. In the 80s, he moves up quickly. He becomes undersecretary general of what is then known as the Supreme Council of Antiquities. He then moves up higher than that. The last thing, one of the last things that Hosni Mubarak did in 2010, before he was deposed, was appoint Zahi Hawass to a ministerial position. He created a whole new position for him, Minister of Antiquities. He was in control of it all. That's the position he had when he was deposed in 2011. When Mubarak was deposed, Hawass was deposed, and he was put on trial. And as I've said to you, and I've said on the air before, when all the people were allowed then to speak out against Zahi Hawass, now his career basically is from the early 80s through 2011, all the time he was in power, all the time everybody who's listening to us tonight who has seen all those shows and Nova specials and the History Channel and this channel and that channel and there's a was all over these last 20 years on television. He was Mr. The, they called him Indiana Jones, which is an insult to Indiana Jones. It, 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 <laughs> oh, man. It, I mean, all of this going on. And so let's bring it up to where we are. So what him was all these young Egyptologists, all the people that had worked for him. There was so many people lined up to bring charges against him. They had a 
1,700 page indictment. Not 1,700 counts, 1,700 pages against him in 2011, but every charge was dropped. Why? Because even after Mubarak was deposed, even though they went through that period and then Sisi in the Muslim Brotherhood move in, I mean, uh, Morsi, excuse me, Morsi in the Muslim Brotherhood come in and take over the government, they kept all judiciary the same. All the Supreme Court judges, all the appeal court judges, all the higher prosecutors in Egypt were all appointed by Hosni Mubarak. A lot of them were personal friends of Zahi Hawass and are still today. So the charges were all dropped. So he's been citizen Mubarak, but he's still publicity. He actually is scheduled to do a tour with Graham, not a tour, a debate for one day with Graham Hancock in April of 2015. So he's still active. He's still been doing interviews. He still goes on. He's still talking about it. And he totally believed that when uh, uh, Sisi became the president, took over again, that he's going to come back to power. He still thinks he's going to come back to power. Now, what the case is that's going on today goes back again to 2013. actually happened a week before we, Brian and I, were, did our work in the Great Pyramid. There's two German researchers. One man I actually have met, a man named Stefan Erdmann and another man named Dominik Gerlitz. Right. Stefan Erdmann I actually met in 2006 in Abdel Hakim's house, in the Aoyan house, interviewing Hakim in German. Now, I don't know if Hakim gave him this idea, but we'll go to what, what the whole story is about. They supposedly, in 2013, Dominic Gerlitz claims he has archaeological background, he's a credentialed archaeologist. They went and they got permission to go in the Great Pyramid and to go in the chambers above the Great Pyramid. For people who don't know this, there is the different chambers in the Great Pyramid, the subterranean chamber, that's called the Queen's Chamber, they're all misnamed, except for the subterranean chamber. That's the only one that's correctly. There's no queen, there was no king. But Queen's Chamber, King's Chamber. And then, discovered in just the last couple of hundred years, they found that there are chambers above the King's Chamber. There are five of them. First one discovered in 1765 by a British uh, uh, researcher named Nathaniel Davison. Then, Four other chambers were found in 1837 by another British-led man named Richard Howard Weiss. All important names here. And so they found markings in these chambers above. There have been no evidence of anything in the Great Pyramid. No hieroglyphs, no marks. That's nothing right. was ever found in the Great Pyramid. Until right. these times, they found markings. And then in the upper chamber, the last one at the top, they believe they found what's known as a cartouche. A cartouche is a, a knot of papyrus, which would be inscribed a title, a royal title. Not a name, a title. So they believe that they found the title of what said Khufu, Khufu is supposedly the ancient name of, of the man who they was told by tradition, but was told by Herodotus, which is where the whole story comes from, Herodotus the Greeks, that this was a tomb for a king named Cheops in Greek, Khufu in the ancient language. They found this. They, this is proof that this was his tomb, blah, blah, blah. This has been used by Hawass, Mark Lehner, all the modern Egyptologists. Even today, they're still arguing that this is legitimate. And so the idea was... First well, of all, I, let, me ju- let me jump in there really quick. Sure. That that piece of uh, writing, you know, up above the king's chamber and that little, uh, I would never go up there. It's totally claustrophobic. Oh, totally I insane. To yeah, totally I, insane. The, unfortunately, but, did what the case that we're talking about now has made it impossible for the rest of us to go up there. But. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, uh, so anyway, anybody could have written that. It's not any indication of, of Khufu, uh, Khufu directly. Well, it's in red ochre paint. First of all, it's not in the style. Usually then the glyphs would be in carved, incised reliefs, in stone. They didn't do writing in red ochre paint at that time. I've challenged many, many Egyptologists to show me other examples of red ochre paint from the fourth dynasty, from that time period. No one has ever answered. No one has ever responded. There is none. And, but, you know, again, Hakim always would say the marks were forgeries because there's no writing. The Great Pyramid, we say, is well over 20,000 years old, which means it was way before there was any writing. That's any right. Writing it found in it would have been put in there later, et cetera. But, again, it was Zachariah Sitchin who brought the story out in 1985 in his second book called Wars of Gods and Men. He had a chapter called Forging the Pharaoh's Name, where he talked about a series of events that uh, uh, had led that and and. and that he believed the marks were forged, and they were forged during the time of Howard Weiss. He actually brought people in there, went in there, and later he was contacted. Now, this, again, is only, it's, it's, it's not direct evidence anymore. It's anecdotal because we don't have the act evidence. But he was contacted after he wrote that book, and before he wrote his book after that, it was called uh, um, 
uh, he was contacted by a family in Pennsylvania, and they had said that he, what he had wrote was true, that they had had a relative, that their relatives had come from Britain, and they, Brit they had a British relative named Humphreys Brewer. He was a young apprentice mason hired by a man named John Perring. The, Richard Howard Weiss had a team with him. He brought a mining engineer named John Perring, who was an expert in using gunpowder to blast away. They, of course, blasted their way into the Great Pyramid and did damage. I mean, they were trying to find treasure. They were trying to find something that was going to bring them glory. That's all they were interested in, not truth, not artifacts, nothing like that. And so he brought this man, John Perring, who brought two other experts with him and hired this young man from England named Humphreys Brewer to work on there as a mason. This man wrote a letter to his family in England saying one night he went in the Great Pyramid, he heard that they were above the king's chamber, he went up there to look, and he saw them forging the material. He mm. saw them writing the pharaoh's name. Mm. He wrote the letter. Unfortunately, the letter has disappeared. If the letter would be the smoking gun, but Sitchin wrote about it in his book and put it out there. It always, it always impressed me. I always believed those marks were not real. And when I met Hakim and talked to him about it, he said, no doubt those marks are fake because they're using the wrong signs, wrong lists. They didn't write in that style, in that supposed time period, and they didn't write in red ochre paint. Well, so Stevens. the whole idea is, I don't know if this is a true story or not, but I told this to Robert Bouval, and he's the one backing this whole case against Hawass now. I didn't speak to Stefan Erdman in English. We never spoke to each other, just a few pleasantries. He spoke to Hakim. He may have asked Hakim about those marks, and Hakim may have said to him, those marks are not real. Somebody, not telling him to go do that, but he said somebody should test the paint. It's very easy to do, and they can say what date it comes from. Well, so he may have had that idea. He may have decided to do it in 2006. But what the story is, is they went up in 2013. They say they had permission to do this. They did not take any samples from the cartouche. Again, from where the supposed king's name is, they took it from an inscription next to it. They took some samples. They have admitted to doing that. They took some of the red ochre paint to test. It could be very easily tested to be shown that it's only about 150 years old, not mm -hmm. 4,500. 4, and, and somehow they were found out. I don't even know because I've been in contact with Dominic Gerlitz and Robert Bouval about this. They were found out. And so the charges were brought against them in Egypt. Charges were brought against them in Germany. They supposedly had to turn over all samples. I don't know for truth if they actually have, but they supposedly had to turn off all samples to German police, send it back to Egypt. They were tried in absentia along with the tour guide and everyone, the people who, the antiquities police who was ever on duty at that time, they're now known as the Giza Six. They have been convicted. Some of them are in jail. The Germans have been convicted in absentia. Of course, they can never return to Egypt. There's no extradition. They're not going to be sent to Egypt. Egypt, and uh, but there are people in jail. Yeah, so, five years of labor. But listen to how now Hawass gets involved, because one of our dear colleagues, who you'll name you'll hear me speak about when we talk about redating the Sphinx, who worked with John Anthony West, is Dr. Robert Schock from Boston University. If you have not interviewed him, he's a great interview. He has done the most work. We use his theories to redate the Sphinx. We use geology to date the Sphinx. That's right. Use geology can also date the Great Pyramid to show it's much older than it, they say it is. So, shock put online, all over the internet, on Facebook, a picture of the cartouche he had taken in 2005, perfectly intact. He posted another picture next to it that he had taken the year after 2006, and the cartouche was damaged. So the evidence, and again, when this case was brought against the Germans, it was Hawass who screamed out in the Egyptian press immediately. He went on television, he went on the Egyptian press, saying these Germans have to be tried, they have damaged the king's name. He said it. Hawass, before the, German, the Egyptian prosecutors even knew about any of the damage, Hawass was the one who brought it to the public that the cartouche was damaged. But now Robert Schock has proved that the damage to the cartouche happened between 2005 and 2006. So what is that, Stephen? Let me, uh, let, un, well, let me just finish the story so you can know why they charged him. Okay, That's under okay. Hawass's watch. He was in control then, so the charges being brought against him now is that he conspired to damage an Egyptian monument. It's a grave charge, very grave charge, that if a normal human being would be 10 years at least hard labor, he is not going to spend a day in jail. Well, both the Germans... Still those, he still has those connections. Well, both the Germans and the Egyptians uh, all said that uh, Zahi told him to do it. I mean, that's, that's what they have said. They said that uh, we did it under his direction. No, it couldn't have been in 2013. When no, he was doing... gone in 2013, and he had, he even said, he said, look, my, my position ended there in 2010. But, but the Germans said everything that we did 
he told us to do. Right. And so, like you said, it was under it was under his watch, regardless. Well, the damage now we know occurred in 2006. There's no doubt about it because Robert Schock has the photographic evidence. Right, right, right. And right. it was under Zahi's watch. So he can, you know, technically that's a legitimate charge, but he's going to get out of it. You again, he he's he's a snake oil salesman. He's he's had, and again, he has contacts in in the in the Egyptian government too. You know, it's but, called it's called karma, though, Stephen, too, oh, yeah. as well. You oh, know, yes. with, with when it comes to Zahi, oh, yeah. people have said there were rumors going around this guy forever, forever. Oh, yeah. They went on and went on and went on. And now, you you know, this fall from grace that has happened, well, you That's know, right. He'll it, be it's disgraced. karma. He will be disgraced. There's no doubt. He hasn't sure. been dis- There's no honest Egyptologist in the world who really backs him anymore. I mean, it, it's been for years that they were afraid of him because if he needed to have access to anything in Egypt, he was a, he was a dictator. He sought himself as pharaoh. I mean, the truth <laughs> is, Ayahuasca comes out in 1987. There was a great NBC special that was narrated by Omar Sharif, had, had uh, uh, Mark Lehner featured in it. And so, at the end of the special, Omar Sharif is standing in the king's chamber. 1987, this was shown on NBC television. And Zahi comes in and he says to him, I don't know, Dr. Hawass, all the things you said, this incredible monument, this incredible, it must have been more than just a tomb for a king. It must have been more. How do you know that? And Zahi Hawass looks at him, looks at the camera and says, because I was Khufu. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you that's should hear. how he looked at it. He looked at the Great Pyramid as his own personal monument. You should hear uh, Jason Martell's impression of Zahi Hawass. Oh, man, it's, it's good. It'll make you laugh. Um, I wanted to back up, uh, uh, and you had mentioned uh, Graham Hancock and Zahi doing a debate. What is the debate going to be on, do you know? <laughs> I, I, I want to be there so bad. No, I, I think it's a sham. I'm, I'm very upset at Graham for doing that, even giving Zahi Hawass the light of day to do that. Even his very good close friend, Robert Bouval, thinks it's a mistake. Everybody in the field thinks it's a mistake. Not to give him any light of day. It's going to be a, he's going to debate Egyptology, and Graham's going to de- debate the alternative. But Graham is not even prepared. I mean, if you if it was to be anybody to debate, it should have been Abdel Hakim. Right, I mean, right, would have sure. Destroyed him within thirty seconds. There's no debate. That's the point. There's no debate. Hawass is not even really adequately trained in Egyptology, but that's the position he's going to defend. And and Graham Hancock is not an is not an archaeologist. He's not a geologist. He's not. I mean, he he's really is a great writer. I mean, he's, he's a journalist. He did some great books. Sign in the seal. Fingerprints of the gods. Yes, mysteries of the Sphinx, no doubt, but he's not qualified. I, I don't know, alternative. Stephen. Stephen, you wouldn't want to debate Graham. I wouldn't. <laughs> that's a, that's a, you got to come armed and dangerous, and I don't think Zahi's prepared for that. So, you know, let Graham have a crack at him. No, I, I think gonna it's going to be a gonna sideshow. Be, uh, it's just going to be a sideshow. Oh, you you want to be there? Come on, Stephen. Sell tickets? No, I'm going to be there in March, and that's what we're talking about tonight. I'm going to be there March 8th to 21st with Brian Foster, with Yusuf Awiyan and Muhammad Ibrahim, and we're going to talk about the Gosford glyphs. We're going to talk about the connection between ancient Egypt and ancient Peru. We're going to also have an extension in March 20, March uh, let's say 21st to 24th, where we're going to go to Baalbek in Lebanon, which is the greatest oh, megalithic site in man. the world, which has always been at the top of my bucket list. Oh, oh, I'm so jealous. I was telling Brian the other day, I said, you know, it's one thing to talk about, you know, Bolivia or, or, or Peru, uh, Giza, and to look at some of the stuff. It is, it's great. But you know what, Baalbek? That's a whole nother. We're talking a whole nother level of moving stones. That takes it to it. We're going to say it's the same because, again, what we're going to teach is that what is today Lebanon, what is today Egypt, was all part of Kemet, was all the part of the same civilization. What we may be looking at at Baalbek is some of the earliest stuff, some of the oldest. I mean, and again, some of the largest hewn blocks ever found on this they're, planet. They're enormous. Yes, 1,500 tons and above. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's crazy. And, and uh, one of the things that it, it is repeated over and over again, which we all understand, uh, with modern technology, we couldn't. We'd have a hard time moving it if well, we could again, move them we, at all. We, we can discuss it in detail. We've had all these engineers there. 
Uh, we have in Egypt, in Aswan, it's called the Unfinished Obelisk, because they found a crack underneath it, but they were right. undercutting it with every intention. Right. It is the longest. It's longer than any of the ones at Baalbek, but it doesn't weigh as much because the ones at Baalbek are thicker. Yeah. It's 110 feet long, estimated to weigh 1,200 tons. They had every intention of cutting this, raising it, and putting it up. And, and they could do it like it was nothing. I mean, it was easy for them. And so it is the same type of understanding that they worked with tonnage. And how we can talk today is, Hakim used to talk about this unfinished obelisk to people in the 80s. It is only in the 2000s, I think 2006, where they have developed a crane in the UK, in the Great Britain, Britain that can lift a thousand tons. Right. But it has to have a 500 ton counterweight so it doesn't tip over. So we're saying even today we could not lift the obelisk that's in situ in Aswan that weighs 1,200 tons. No, we could not lift the, the obelisks that are, the blocks that are there in Baalbek that are 1,500 tons or more. Well, you know, and you, you just said something that I think is key here, even though I, I, I've said it in the past, but the, how did that? Well, you know what they did it because it was easy, and that right. is a key word. They right. knew something right. that we didn't today, right. and and that same knowledge, whatever it is, whether we're talking China, whether we're talking Indonesia, or 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 Peru, uh, or ancient Egypt, wh whatever continent or or civilization that we're talking about, they knew each one of them knew the secret. They something made. It was nothing to them. They didn't right. have 50,000 slaves. Talking about, well, we're talking about over 12,000. Again, going with Hakeem's general outline that Brian now and I put together, what other people are working on, we're not alone, of course, is a general paradigm that over 12,000 years ago, instead of calling it Atlantis, Lemuria, we call it the global maritime culture, that there was not just in one area like Egypt or Peru, there were advanced civilizations all around the planet. That's why pyramids are found all around the planet. And again, we use the expression, David Hatcher Childress has used it, another great researcher named Gunnar Thompson has used it use it. I don't know who originated the phrase, but I love it. I use it. The oceans were not barriers. They were highways. That's right. The ancient people knew the trade winds. They knew the currents. They moved all around the world. We have distinct evidence. We have found evidence in a tomb in Egypt, a fifth dynasty tomb. We just found it in last April. Brian was there with me. Uh, uh, this is 2350 BCE. We're talking almost four, four. 400 years ago, where a priest is saying that the, that the ancient Egypt Commissions, who we call them, not Egyptians, had been to Peru. An inscription on the wall there that says the direction from Kemet to Peru was across four waters. The four waters would have been the Nile, would have been the Atlantic, would have been the Pacific, would have been the Amazon. Interesting. So, we have, and now we can talk about, if you want to go into, distinct evidence that the ancient Egyptians made it not only to the Americas, but also to Australia. Yeah, le, to le, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's, uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. But it, 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 there's a commonality between all of these, and it's, it, it's the designs that we're talking about. We're talking about pyramids. That seems to be consistent. Right. You know, molded megalithic rocks that, that, are, that, that fit together in a stupid way. Not molded. Um, I well, mean, you I'm know kidding. what I mean. I you, know what you mean by molded, by fit together. They like fit together so. in a way that just wouldn't make sense. A modern right, engineer. Again, when you talk of the work of Christopher Dunn, who's one of the key people we That's rely right. on, That's you right. see advanced machining. You see evidence of perhaps only diamond drills could cut through the hardest That's right. material on the planet. Granite, diorite, basalt, calcite. Unbelievable. Yeah, and, and I said to Brian the other day uh, uh, off the air, uh, I said, it's not so much the, the size it's not, you know, it's not the, the, the intricate sides of things. No. You know what trips me out is some of it is just so flat. You know, how do you get with a round pounding stone? How are you getting it flat? That's, that's, it, that is machine. Something is making these, uh, these flat surfaces. Now, to get the flat surfaces, you have to have a measuring tool that is flat. Exactly. To have them, where, it's, a it's a catch-22. It's a catch-22. That's right. This is called metrology. This is where Chris Dunn brings in a brilliance which many, many people have not understood. Not only do you have the ability 
to make these type of cuts, perfect right angles, perfect circles, and tolerances that he measured because he comes with a beveled, a beveled uh, square that he, in his machine shops in Danville, Illinois, Chris Dunn has been a professional, uh, well, he's retired now, but he still works in the field, over 50 years since he was a journeyman apprentice machinist at the age of 16, was, was uh, recruited by American Aerospace in, uh, Industry at the age of 18, 19, brought over to the U.S., has worked in aerospace technology and high-speed manufacturing lasers, all of that. No one could recognize it like he could. He comes with a machine level to two ten thousandths of an inch, and he shows the flatness is unperfect. But we have now just discovered recently that they may have not machined to the flatness. They machined to cut the corners, to do the squares and things like that, right. but they may have actually used, we have found evidence now, in one of the sites we take people to is known as the Serapium, where because it's underground, there is these stone boxes out of rose granite, black granite, gray granite, basalt. How many is there? There's like 20, right? There's 33. That 33, I right, 33 right. niches, and there's more. We find that there's more levels to it, more chambers. There's many, many more involved. This is only to scratch the beginning of what this is, but because it's underground, it's pristine, hasn't been exposed to the elements. Elements to the so that's why this is where Chris Dunn found what he called the smoking gun, where he found tolerances and precision to two ten thousandths of an inch, and we also have found evidence that they may have used abrasives like acids to actually polish the stone to come up with this incredible. Where you actually can I can take you to the Serapium. We can look, take one of these boxes in black granite, and you can see your reflection in it like it's a mirror. Yeah, and uh, when I was watching you and Christopher down in the Seraphim, and one of the one of the things that just flips me out is he, you know, he always goes around him and and Brian have that leveling tool, yeah, in, you know, right? They're always leveling stuff, right. and he, he walks up to one of the granite boxes. Well, he walks up to a few, but he walks up to, and it's this thing is massive. I have massive. no idea how many tons it is, but but ton by the, right, and but it's tons of box seventy tons, and it's perpendicular to the earth. Now, right. now, if you uh, if you're c- uh, carving, uh, I don't know how how many feet long, how many feet wide, how many feet deep, inside, outside, around yeah. it, exactly. and and you and you're off by a degree or two, exactly. three th- five thousand years ago. How are you correcting that? And and it's still perpendicular today. And as you said, not only did they, Chris brought out, not only did they have the tools to do the manufacturing, they had to have the tools to measure their precision. That's my he point. There was a yes. reason why it was made to that type of precision, so they had to have the ability to measure to that. That's precision. my point. You know, that's you're a ecology. degree. Off. That's a whole other science. It is. Ecology. It is. And if you're a degree off, you got to turn to your boys and go, "Okay, come on, we got to make this right." Exactly. It, <laughs> what's the reason? Now, exactly. obviously. Uh, a slave, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're slaving somebody into doing this, but, no but no did, was it slaves or, no. or, 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 but back to my point, they did it because it was easy for them. Yeah. No, you're talking about the advanced scientists, engineers. Yes, yes, I mean, yes. The priests, all of these above all than one. But of course, no, again, I always like to point out when I do these lectures, slavery was invented by the Greeks and Romans, particularly by the Romans. There were no slaves in Egypt until the very end of its civilization. They were paid workers. We find in what's called the Middle Kingdom period, around 1800 BCE, that they found a papyrus of documents where workers had gone on strike because they weren't getting enough of onions and garlic to eat. So, I mean, slaves don't go on strike. Can you imagine in the American South, you know, they sat down when they know we're not going to work, Master. You know, you didn't, you don't pay us enough or whatever. Yeah, right. You'd be lynched the next second. So, uh, um, I mean, no, slaves don't go on strike. So there were no slaves. In <laughs> that's Egypt. right. That's right. It was because it was easy. They yeah. had the tools. Yeah. They had but the machines. We have a beautiful piece of, of a, a, another smoking gun that's in the Cairo Museum. Very few people have seen. We take our people to see because it's a box that's behind the box. If you go in the Cairo Museum, anyone who's listening to me tonight that's been to Egypt, been in the Cairo Museum, you take a left. And when you go to the left, it's supposedly the Old Kingdom period. It's the oldest. Well, they have a bunch of stone boxes there, which, of course, they call sarcophagus, Greek word. Sarcophagus means body eater. Supposedly a sarcophagus is where you put a coffin, where you put a body. But again, we find these stone boxes all over Egypt, particularly underground, where there never were any burials. There never were any boxes. There was never anybody buried in the stone box in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. So we just call them resonance boxes because that's where they were. But here is the smoking gun in front of one beautiful box 
of rose granite, there's another one behind it of rose granite. Now, people to understand, well, if you understand what I'm talking about in stone, rose granite. Granite, of course, is the hardest stone we have uh, as an igneous rock that comes out of volcanoes. Highly quartz crystal. So it's the quartz that must be cut. When you're cutting a piece of granite, it's not the feldspar, which is the substrate that you have to worry about cutting through. It's the crystal. Crystal is on the Mohs scale, MOHS, the scale that geology rates the hardness of stone. Quartz crystal can be anywhere from 6.5 to 7, even sometimes as high as 7. And five, depending on the hardness of the course. But we say seven for uh, 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 average. Stephen, let me jump so, in really quick. This is Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We are talking with Stephen Mailer. And we're talking about how they actually got this stuff cut. So, uh, we're, And we're talking about Giza. Had to get that in there, Stephen. Okay, certainly. continue. Certainly. So you have to have to cut granite. You have to have something that's going to cut the quartz. Now, we have already tested the stone. The stone that comes from Aswan is the rose granite used throughout Egypt. It's anywhere between 45 to 55 percent rose quartz crystal. So it's very highly crystalline. So we find another rose granite box right behind this perfect box. No labels, of course. That's how the Cairo Museum is. And that's how Egyptologists are. If they have anomalies that they can't explain, they'll just put it in the corner without any label. And, you know, just you're supposed to ignore of course. it. Of right. This box still had its lid attached to it, which, number one, shows one thing in particular, that they would use the lid and this box would be cut from the same mother piece. So in other words, the lid was not cut from another piece of granite and put on there all the same piece. So it's for its harmonic, for its resonance. So this, was, this lid was being sawed. You can actually see this cut marks. It's going in. All of a sudden, the operator, the priest, the engineer, whoever it was, lost control of the tool, and it went into the box. And they stopped the work, and they left it. So when you're talking about before, that it had to be done perfectly, what we see, the result, the final pieces, it had to be perfect or not at all, they did not reuse pieces. And we're talking about very ancient times, over 12,000 years ago. They did not then go back, cut up the lid, cut up the box, use the pieces, as later civilizations, particularly the Romans did, would cut up the ancient pieces, and the Greeks did, would make columns in pieces. The ancient Comitians made columns in single blocks that are 15 tons, 20 tons, or more, 100-ton blocks. So they left the lid on, and the tool had gone into the piece. So this has led us to have all different types of speculation, because we also find that there was an outline in the stone that whatever tool was being used was supposed to follow in black. Now, when we first looked at it, and again, in the museum these days, you're not allowed to bring cameras. You're not even supposedly allowed to bring flashlights. But I snuck one in, of course. And so we're looking under, at least under flashlight, and I had a magnifying glass. What we first see is what I first thought was this outline that the tool was supposed to follow to cut the lid off was, I thought, in black ochre paint, because it's in black. But when I looked at it, it the, the outline was actually in the stone. So well, how, how did that happen? Yeah, okay. That, well, here's that's my question. We believe, now you're just, we're getting a whole summary of now things that Hakim taught. When Hakim first got me and decided that I was going to be the son, this is where I was leading to, leading to that I was to be the son that he always wanted. Because his sons, now Yusuf has followed in his path, yes, but they never followed academically. I came to him, already had degrees in the sciences, already was a field archaeologist, already had studied Egyptology on my own. I was the perfect credential background for that son that he always wanted. So he not only treated me as his student, disciple, but as his son, and brought me into his family, and I am treated as the oldest son by the family today. And so I was the one to be able to do it, and he wanted me to concentrate in my work because of my background on water and sound. The knowledge that the ancients had of both and the interplay of both. So what we're saying here was water was the source of all the energy that they used for the Giza power plant that Chris Dunn wrote his book in 1998 where he labeled the Great Pyramid as a power plant. The Giza power plant was fueled by water, Water was the source of all the energy. We have never needed fossil fuels. We have never needed nuclear energy. We have never needed to pollute this planet. This has only been the consciousness in the last 5,000 years. The ancient people knew how to work with natural energies, natural laws. Nikola Tesla only rediscovered what the ancient people knew, free energy. And it was all based on an acoustic science, a knowledge of sound which we're just approaching today. They use sound to cut stone, to shape stone, to alter the physics of stone to make it easier to cut. They use sound to create anti-gravity fields. 
Hakim would sit down in front of an audience of people, and it didn't make a difference if it was 400 people or it was 10. And he would say to them, the only way to deal with all this weight is to deal with the gravity. Boom. There was the theory right there. This is what Edward Neat Scalman knew, why, how he built Coral Castle under the same understanding, using acoustic sound to create anti-gravity field. This has already been demonstrated in the laboratory by acoustic engineer Tom Danley. There's a famous uh, video that came out by John Anthony West with Robert Schock in 1992. It was an NBC special, Mysteries of the Sphinx. People can get it on DVD today. It's still worth seeing, even though it's 20 years old, because basically there Tom Danley demonstrates the principle in the lab. How I can explain it to people scientifically very simply is you send out a sound wave and you have a reflecting device that's going to send that sound wave back to you. When those sound waves cross each other, it's called sinusoidal waves. They make these hills, and just like a, a big wave, a current, like we think of electrical waves, where you've seen waves, pulsing waves. When they cross each other, they create what are called wells. When they cross each other, in those wells, gravity no longer exists. It has been proven in the laboratory. So here's Hakim was telling people in the 80s even maybe as far back as the 70s, that they used sound to create anti-gravity fields. That's how the pyramids were built. That's how they could deal with these kind of weights. And they used sound to cut the stone, using maybe diamond drills, maybe just a sonic wave itself. So what we speculate on this particular stone that I'm talking about is they had already, by using their mind, not by using a tool, had drawn an outline in the stone using some type of a sonic tool that was going to be where the tool was going to follow and cut. But somehow they lost control. They were not perfect. They were human, much more perfect than we are. We couldn't build a Great Pyramid today. There's no money in the world. Not even the Koch brothers have enough money to build a Great Pyramid. But they... They were human, too, and they left their mistakes for us to see. This is the beautiful thing why Chris Dunn has written his second book, which I highly recommend to people, came out in 2010, called Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, where all he talks about, all the machining, all the tool marks we've seen, they left their mistakes for us to see because they covered them up by just another block or another wall. They never, you know, realized, they never considered it a mistake that somebody's going to look at them and criticize that their work wasn't perfect. No. Twitter is on fire right now. You can follow us on Twitter at jchurchradio, hashtag dmradionet. It's absolutely on fire. I want to, let me, let me get to uh, a couple of questions that popped by on Twitter before uh, we get uh, too far away from this. Um, Nancy says, she wants to know if you wrote... Uh, the land of uh, Osiris from Hakim's point of view. Yes, the land of Osiris is what we call an introduction to chematology. It was when that I had coined the phrase. First, I had used the title that he used to call it. In the ancient language, it was called Boo Wizard. Boo is really means land. Wizard was the way they pronounced Osiris. Many people today use translations like Osar, Uzar, Wizard. He used the word wizard directly and said the English words wizard and wisdom came directly from that word. So that's where we came. But then when I originally was going to publish the book, Barbara Hanklau was going to publish it for Baron Company, which she sold before the book came out. That's why it came out in Ventures Unlimited Press with David Atcher Childress. I, it is an introduction to chemitology. What the land of Osiris is, is the basic outline that Hakim gave us for the system, which is chemitology, of how you look at pyramids, how you look at temples, who the, how the Sphinx is female, the, what we call the five stages of the sun, where the term pyramid comes from, where the term pharaoh comes from, where the term tomb comes from, and how pyramid comes from a term pranetra. Netter has been incorrectly translated by Egyptologists as actually meaning divinity, deity. They're teaching us that the, Egyptolo the Egypt Egyptians were worshipping 700 different deities. They were not. Netter never meant deity. It actually was the first one to, to really fully recognize that was the person that, that John Anthony West is a champion of, a French Alsatian philosopher, mathematician, R.A. Schwala de Lubitsch, mm -hmm. who in the 1950s was writing that the word Netter is Minsk translated by, mistranslated by Egyptologists. It didn't mean divinity, it meant divine principle, or principle of creation. Hakim further translated as a sense. So Hakim would teach us that we're innately born with 360 senses. We label 180 feminine, 180 masculine. And so he would say to people, I don't want to be insulting, but if you think you're only using five senses, we are crippled today. 
We're not using our full capacity. So what we're saying is they turned these concepts of principles that are within us as being divine principles of creation. Socrates used to say, know thyself. If you know everything about the human body, you know everything about the universe, as above, so below. Basically, that's the commission understanding uh, that what's in us, divine principles, became deities, became God. That's how religion evolved, taking these divine principles and making them divinities. That's how religion evolved. That's my second book. But yes, both books, Land of Osiris and From Light into Darkness, were written from Hakim's perspective. You know, almost people said, well, you should have put his name in there as co-author. He asked me not to. So that's key. He didn't want to be identified as the writer of a book. But it was the oral tradition. He was proud of me that what the Land of Osiris, what From Light into Darkness, is just capturing ideas for the moment. Of course, I first wrote the first draft of Land of Osiris in 1998. You know, here we are, 2014. It continues. It continues. What we have as chemitology is a living book. It continues what Yusuf is doing every day in the field that he takes people out. We continue to add to it. But Hakim gave us the foundation. So the Land of Osiris gives you the structure. If you want to know what chemitology is all about, that is the foundation. That's the basis of the teaching, and it's translated into four different languages, which I'm very proud of, and so is he. Not only in English, of course, but the first translation was in Russian. Second came in Croatian. I am actually one of the founders of the whole Croatian uh, pyramid craze. And then it came out in uh, uh, Czech, and then last in Italian. Uh, you had said earlier, this is also from Twitter, it, it, You, we kind of blew past this, but you said something about Giza being 20,000 years old. Um, what were you referencing with that, or were you just generalizing? No, it was generalizing because we can't have exact dates. The pyramids, over 20,000. Giza itself, Hakim told us, was 65,000 years. We have what we call the five stages of the sun. The five stages represent the daily movement of the sun through the sky, but they also represent stages in our consciousness in different periods of time, and they represent eras of our prehistory. So we have now, we're in the fifth stage now coming out of it into a new awakening, a new dawn. So we talk about that. So he talks about this full five stages being 65,000 years long. So he dates the Sphinx being the first thing carved above ground. They did first underground, building tunnels for hydraulic engineering to bring water from what is today the Western Desert into what is today the Nile Valley. This, everything was done underground before they did anything above ground. But the first thing carved above ground before any temples, any sphinx, uh, any pyramid was the sphinx. She's called Tefnut. She's a representation of the Great Mother. The story that the indigenous tradition passes down is the Great Mother is the creatrix of everything. It's not just they talk about the being God and God is equal. No. In this tradition, a matriarchal tradition, all that's created, all that's uncreated comes from the feminine, from the Great Mother. When the Great Mother decided she wanted to manifest in physical form on the earth, she spit. Where her spit landed is today the Sphinx. They carved a statue to honor her. Why? So she's known as Tef Newt, the mother of the sky, the one that's the unmanifested and manifest, was known as Newt. She's depicted on all the coffins, all the tombs of the dynastic Egyptians because from mother you come from, from mother you return. So they always had that matriarchal understanding they were going to return to the sky, to the mother of the sky. That what, is, what, is, what does Robert Baval think about that when uh, he's focused on Leo rising? at, at 10,500 BC, and that's right. why the Sphinx was carved then at 10,500 BC, because it was pointing to Leo rising. Right. Um, Orion was behind it and lined up with the pyramids. Uh, so at that time, at 10,500 years ago, with this, uh, with Hakim's statement of 65... No, he stated the Sphinx as being 54,000 years old. Okay, well, so what does Baval think about that? Well, he doesn't agree. <laughs> that. There's many things we don't agree. We don't agree about the markings in the Great Pyramid. He thinks they're legitimate. He thinks it was a tomb for a king. Even though he thinks it was a line 10,500 B.C., as he wrote in one book, he's now writing he thinks it was a Khufu and it was a tomb for a king. No. He thinks the marks are legitimate. Really? Really? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it, we, look, this look. This is the strongest disagreement we have right now because I can prove definitively that the marks are forgeries, and he, and he doesn't want to stand up to that. Well, so, I uh, can prove it, too. You know how I prove it? How? Because Stephen, if you if you built that that pyramid for you, your name would be all over it. 
backwards, work. frontwards, inside, outside. Not only that, Jimmy, <laughs> they're claiming that workers did these marks who could not read or write. Only priests could read or write. Bingo. And so what they, they say the markings are saying is we're the drunken gang of Khufu, we're the southern gang of Khufu. That would be blasphemy, even according to Egyptology's own teachings for the priest to allow that to have still appeared on the walls even though it would be above and nobody would see it would be blasphemy they never would have allowed those markings to be there they would have been erased by the priest 4500 years ago exactly and that's my argument because it's called common sense (laughs) that's it it's common sense if i'm a king and i'm building something like that for myself I'm putting my name on it. And that's it. All over it. There's not going to be which any questions. Which they did in their tombs. Which if you see in their that's right. tombs, there's all these prayers and all the deities, all the netters, they make prayers to them and they say how good they were in their lifetime. It was a game. How much wealth you had depended on the biggest tomb you had. Yes, yes. How much the good grave goods would be in it. It was a game. The priest said, I mean, I explained that in my second book, how religion came to be. When we're talking about ancient commissions 20,000 years ago, Hakim teaches us there was no word for death in the Suf language. They said they were going to the West or Westing, just changing form. Ancient people did not believe death was the end or that there was an afterlife or there was any of that. This all comes in the last five to seven thousand years with the creation of our modern religions, particularly our patriarchal religions, that they could come to you and say, well, do you know, what do you think happens with this thing, this flesh envelope, when you, you know, I don't know, we never cared about it before. Right. Well, we'll take care of it for that's you. That's right, that's right. We'll take care, we'll do prayers, we'll make guarantee you can come back to it. Right. We'll make it, but that's how mummification <laughs> began. It's all a distortion. Most of what Egyptology is based on is a distortion. Was it, was, was it a bastardization of what the ancients were. To say that the pyramids were built as tombs is an insult to our great ancestors who created free energy devices that powered the planet over 12,000 years ago. Well, just look at another example, and for any Egyptologist, this is what I would lay out in front of them. Look at the Valley of the Kings. From the entrance of a tomb to the very back wall, everything is there it's carved it's it's painted the stories the life the prayers the, the, it, it's all there on every single wall every single ceiling but yet the the biggest example the, the great pyramid has nothing none of the pyramids That's yeah the none point. of the pyramids none of the stone masonry pyramids until the 5th dynasty have any inscriptions on there at all at all at all and at and all. When, you know you go to dendera you go to luxor i mean this stuff goes from your feet to the ceiling. It's everywhere. That was the game of, re- of religion, I'm sure. And the temples, of course, they have all these great scenes and all these great uh, spells and magical stories and all of that. What's that your favorite what what, What's your favorite site, really quick, just for fun? What's your favorite site? <laughs> That's don't say all of them. I can tell you every one of them. No, don't Giza, say, course, don't say uh, Giza, that. Giza, of course, because Giza is the oldest of the old. It's where the pyramids and sphinx are. There's a reason why everything... Hakim would always say there's a reason why uh, the site dictates what's there. That's what he would say. So the Giza Plateau has, has water running under Every one of these sites had water running under it. I mean, it's just magical, but they're all my favorite sites, but, but particularly the, what I call the Blue Wizard sites, what we call the Land of Osiris, because Hakim would say the, the civilization was called Kem, or Kempt, which meant the black land. That's why we call it Kemet. We put the T ending, which the word became feminine, Kempt, or Chem. In fact, one of the ancient Arabic terms for Egypt, before it's called Al-Misr, Al-Misr as it is today, Al-Masri, it was called Al-Chem, the land of Kem. That's where the word alchemy comes from. I completely define alchemy as the arts and sciences of ancient Kemet. This is where all our modern systems of metaphysics, mysticism, alchemy, all of these things we do today, which we call new age, which are not new at all. It's the old age, come back. And all of this stuff was what was, came out of Egypt. All what the Greeks learned of geometry from plain geometry, but sacred, especially sacred or solid geometry. Pythagoras was initiated in Egypt. And Plato was initiated in Egypt. Aristotle made the great mistake that when Alexander went to Egypt, he didn't go with him. This is why all of our modern philosophy in Western uh, metaphysics is based on Aristotle, who was never where Socrates and Plato were, or the ancients who actually went to Egypt and were initiated there. Somebody just uh, tweeted, what kind of coffee do you drink? <laughs> I don't drink coffee the, at all. Man! <laughs> <laughs> I want some of that. 
Um, uh, so what about, uh, I want to, we, we, we blew past Australia, so we got to come back to that right sure. now, but, uh, but what about, uh, uh, Luxor for me? I mean, it's immense, it's huge, but for me that that's got to feel strange when you walk in there and, and, uh, the immensity and, and how does Luxor hit you when you, when you well, get there? I think I, I, there's two temples there, of course. You're talking about Luxor Temple and Karnak Temple. Yes, yes, Karnak. Karnak Temple has the biggest pillars in the world. It's, it's insane. Where you have those 65 great standing columns. Right. Right. But you know what? It, that's still not even as impressive as the ancient temples were because that is dynastic. And those columns are made in sections, which they did in dynastic periods. We can again if we show you the unfinished obelisk, 110 feet long. It's one piece. If you look at the obelisk that is still there amongst the other parts of Karnak, see Karnak is a, jumbo, a combination of so many different cultures, so many different right, thousands right. of years of centuries. You still have the obelisks there that are one solid piece of rose quartz granite that are erected there. That are the glyphs put on them were put on dynastic times, but the pieces themselves had to be machined from the ancient times, and they're 15, 20 tons. There's some obelisk. That are 50. Again, I've seen blocks of stone now that, I mean, you, can't, you can only put the rough estimates. We're looking at so many hundred ton blocks of granite that they worked with. I mean, it's incredible. The, the, again, as you said, it was easy. And one of the things we point out, again, with this idea of using crystal. Now, I talk to people, and I've, talk, I've said this for many years in, in presentations, whatever's called a vortex a power place, a sacred site, mm -hmm. has three things always present. One, underground running water. Mm -hmm. Two, a source of what is known as natural crystal. Mm -hmm. Third, igneous rock, which is volcanic stone, which is high in crystal. So it's the action of crystal and running water that creates the electromagnetic fields, which are what we feel the energy when people go in to the Great Pyramid today. You know, the Great Pyramid as a machine was basically shut down when we talk about this great cataclysmic event, which we have not brought up yet. We talk about two different time periods now that Brian and I are working on, uh, that pre-cataclysmic and post-cataclysmic. We see evidence, and it's written about several books, in several books that I can mention if people want to follow up on it. Barbara Hancock wrote two books about it, uh, that there was a worldwide cataclysmic event around 12,000 years ago. People put different dates on it. They put, pick different reasons for it. One of them is called the Vela, V-E-L-A, supernova. That this supernova, even many, many light years away, impacted our entire solar system and caused the damage that we see. Other people, like Dr. Robert Schock, think it was severe solar flares. That severe solar activity caused massive damage around our planet. Whatever it was, it is pretty uniformly agreed by many, many people and again, the book that I read that started it off was published by Barbara Hanclough for Bear and Company was called Cataclysm 9500 BC by two British scientists, Alan and Delaire. She followed up on that in uh, 2001 and wrote a book called Catastrophobia. She has now republished it in 2010 and I highly recommend it to everyone called Awakening the Planetary Mind, where she's convinced it was the Vela Supernova and that there's massive evidence that there was a pre-cataclysmic civilization and post-cataclysmic. So when we're talking about the, the pyramids of Giza, the Sphinx, we're talking about pre-cataclysm. When we're talking about the sites at Pumapunku Tijunaku in Bolivia, we're talking about pre-cataclysm. A lot of the, the Incan sites, which they think were built by the Inca, actually show pre-cataclysmic ancient megalithic. That's the, what we're looking at. So the time frame we're cutting off is the 12,000. So it's ever before 12,000, which, which academia, archaeology, anthropology considers modern civilization. They think before 10,000 years ago, we were just living in huts and we were crude cave people barely subsisting during the ice ages and there was no civilization. <laughs> but we find massive evidence and the evidence is overwhelming. Jason Martel. Cataclysmic civilization all around the planet. Jason Martel was on the show last week or the week before and he said one thing, Stephen, that made me, and it happens rarely, but I just went, hmm. <laughs> And this is what he said. He said that they're looking into the possibility of the Ark of the Covenant being placed in the box in the king's chamber as the power source. Uh, not what the it, power source, but he, he, that's what, not an original uh, theory that's been happened before. Uh, other people, uh, actually this goes back to somebody in the 80s who was going through the Bible and actually trying to translate the figures and the, and the cubits and trying to come up with the figures, actually figured that the dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant that are given in the Old Testament would fit exactly inside the box in the king's chamber. So what do you think about that? It might have been power, David. It was not the power source. 
the power source is the pyramid itself. Mm. By activating by sound and by the water, the water channels that came in through the subterranean chamber, once the pyramid was turned on, and we believed it was from a, ga- a gate valve, the Sphinx controls all the energy of the plateau, that when the water was there, it was backed up by what, again, another scientist that I recommend people find, find about, they can Google his name, he's yet to come out with published works, but he's all over internet and Facebook is John Cadman. He's a maritime engineer. He has specialized in just the subterranean chamber of the Great Pyramid. His ideas, Hakim agreed with totally, that when it was first set as a machine, this is now 25,000 years ago, maybe 20,000 years ago, I couldn't tell you exactly, but the water was backed up in what he called a wastegate valve. The water was coming in from the western desert, all the tunnels were built, the machine was ready to be turned on, all they had to do was release the valve, the water came into the subterranean chamber of the Great Pyramid, kicked it into resonance, to vibrating to a frequency where it continued harmonics upon harmonics because of the stone that's in it, the granite, the limestone acting together with the water created a sonic field that broke the water into hydrogen and oxygen. They used the hydrogen for energy. This is, again, the basis of Chris Dunn's book, written in 1998, that the Great Pyramid produced hydrogen gas. It produced much more than that. It produced radio waves, quantum waves. I mean, I could go on and on. We could and go what on was the, about the Great Pyramid. Well, before we get to the top of the hour, give me the quick answer. So what was the uh, what, what did they use all of this energy for? Boom. That is question 101. Yes, it is. George Norrie asked me that question for five years. Everybody that's interviewed (laughs) for whatever they wanted. They had a civilization. The civilization was powered by free energy, electricity, whatever, radio waves, cosmic waves, the energy they had. Like Tesla had a device that where he would have a bank of light bulbs uh, 100 miles away. He did this in Colorado. He had a bank of 175-watt bulbs, no wires, no connection. He was in Colorado Springs 100 miles away. He pushed a button in a box, and the lights went on because they were tuned to the same frequency. What about a a Stargate or a possible uh, uh, transportation system off-world? Yes, but not necessarily even, again, uh, we can get into the question of aliens. You're heading that way. I mean, uh, well, not I, necessarily. I, not really, but we can certainly go there. Yeah, but not necessarily third dimension. Stargate, yes, to other dimensions. The Great Pyramid, Hakim said, one of its many functions was as a radio, but a radio that would receive and transmit yes. and could receive and transmit on all dimensions. So, uh, you know, I'm, I also was a follower of the work of John Velo Melchizedek, who you may know about in his work. Uh-huh. And also, ta- John Velo Melchizedek used to say that the majority of consciousness that exists just witnesses is neither what we could call good or evil. We're always taught about that there supposedly are evil beings out there that are trying to get us from the extraterrestrial level or the interdimensional level or whatever. Magic deals with that a lot, too. But he said the majority of consciousness just witnesses. Hakim would say that the majority of consciousness, too, is just not physical, not third dimension. Right. So was the Great Pyramid a, a portal, a Stargate, a portal? Yes. Could people did not go in the Great Pyramid, but the Great, could the great Pyramid, when it was functioning, it was not a temple. It was not to go inside, because people would have fried with the energy that was in there. That's mm-hmm. why when it broke down mm-hmm. uh, 12,000 years ago from the cataclysm, it ended that function, and then became a temple of initiation to groups like the Rosicrucians, the Masons, and the Egyptian priests themselves. Right. We believe Jesus was initiated in the Great Pyramid. We believe Akhenaten, many, Moses, all the great so many of the great figures of history were initiated in the Great Pyramid. But originally, you could not go inside. There were temples around it, and in those temples, you could experience that energy. But yes, I'm sure, when functioning, you could communicate with consciousness on fourth dimension, fifth dimension, seventh dimension, and higher. This is Fade to Black, Bespoke Radio for the Masses. We are only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow us on Twitter. At J Church Radio, got any questions? You can email me right now, Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. And if you are Twittering with TweetDeck, hashtag DM Radio Net. That is the sandbox. We are talking with Stephen Mailer. We're covering it all tonight. There's some, I can't wait to get you back on the show so we can do the other four days worth of stuff that we need to, to try to get out of the way. No um, problem. Uh, and so let's uh, let's get to Australia. And the reason why I want to get to Australia is because there there's been a lot of evidence and a lot of uh, suggestions out there that 
Uh, we can look at the possibility of Egyptians traveling to the Grand Canyon. Correct. Uh, we have uh, evidence of, of, of Peru, of Bolivia. Upper uh, Michigan Peninsula. Uh, upper Copper. Michigan, yes, yes. Uh, we have all of that. But, but direct evidence right now is uh, these tablets that were uh, 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 dug up over in Australia. No, 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 not tablets. These are inscriptions are on a wall of, of sandstone, on a rock well, I, well, wall. Well, you and I were talking about this earlier. They look like, well, I call them tablets, but right. it also, you know, there's some other intricate carvings on there. And some people have been, and you mentioned this earlier, too, as well. I want to make this perfectly clear. Some people are saying that it's it's too sloppy and it's not precise enough to be Egyptian. I look I at that myself when I yeah. first saw them. Again, and, these, well, these glyphs I, appear in an area called Gosford. It's in, near any outback. It's not near any town. There's no reason for anybody to want to find, go out in this outback area and fake these things, but this is what is believed. Many different theories that they were faked in the 80s, they were faked in the 90s. Right. When I first saw photographs of them, Jimmy, the honest truth in my background, my study with Hakeem, I said that they were faked. They looked like they were modern carved. They were very crude, not looked like any scribe, any priest could have possibly done that, and that was my opinion. It's so, so funny because, and I said this to you earlier, I, I wish somebody could have heard our conversation off the air. It's pretty fascinating. But when, <laughs> but when I first laid eyes on it, I had the exact opposite impression. It looks really old. I mean, it looks it. Lo it when you you look at something that's faked, either it's really too good to be fake or too good to be real. That's the first impression, or it's just sloppy. Right. But you know when something's not right. And when I first saw it, I went, "Wow, this this is." This is the real deal here, and that's how it well, hit me. Well, again, though, if it if it's somebody that knows the language would recognize that who was ever writing it was not versed in the language. So that could tend to let people think, and has made many think, including Egyptologists, that they are faked, because it's obvious that somebody was very crude in the language. Again, not a scribe, not a priest. So somebody that didn't know the language. That's why it's easy to dismiss them as a forgery. However... Again, the website that we have up, www.chemitology.com, is the Kemet School of Ancient Mysticism. Just to bring people up to date on that, after Hakim passed in 2008, Yusuf got together with a woman who had come to Egypt with me in 2005 named Patricia Lehman. She met Hakim. She fell in love with Egypt, said she was going to live in Egypt, came back on the tour in 2007, the last tour that Hakim came. She knew the teachings. She knew what Hakim was teaching. She, met me. she never met Yusuf before 2008. She met him. They fell in love. Hakim passed away. They got married. Yusuf was a transformed man, like many of his siblings were after Hakim passed. He suddenly took up the mantle of his father. They decided to create. Hakim and I talked about in the 90s about starting a school to keep the teachings going. We made his house a temple. He, made, he came to my house here in Colorado in 2006. He blessed this house, made it a second part of the school, a temple. And we said this was to be a living thing. The tradition had to be passed down. It wasn't just for him. It wasn't me. It wasn't his family. It had to keep going. So we created the school concept. They made it reality. Patricia and Yusuf got married. 2009, they created the Kemet School of Ancient Mysticism. Since 2010, we've been doing tours. Now 2013 was the first tour I did with Brian Foster. We did one now 2014. Going to continue to do it. Brian wants to go to Egypt every year for the rest of his life. If he can, <laughs> I mean, that's how in love he is with it, to do tours. And so through the Kemet School, as I said, Yusuf now has self-taught himself hieroglyphics. What, what, page is it, what page is it on on the website? We're uh, texting that out right now. I think if you click on my name, I think, didn't that come up? If you clicked on my name, you go right. No, no, we're on the website now. What page on the website? Oh, I'm sorry. Page for what? Uh, for uh, the Australian picks. Oh, okay. If you look, as you scroll down, you look to the right, it will say videos. It will, it will say articles and videos. There's an article I just wrote about Akhenaten, which is about our tour. Then it will say, the Gosford glyphs, are they real? It's an article that will then lead to a, a YouTube web, uh, link that has the lectures that, again, the director of our, our company is called, uh, 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 it just, well, uh, Muhammad Ibrahim is his name. He's a tour director, tour guide. He's also an Egyptologist. He specializes in hieroglyphics. When he was first looked at this, he got together with Yusuf and he said, no, these are real. They're legitimate. They did a truly scholarly research effort where they transpose the actual glyphs of what's on there and came up with the idea, yes, the person that wrote this was not a scribe, not a priest. But how we got the story is Patricia Aoyan herself just went to Australia this last January.
There she was able to meet some Aboriginal elders, particularly women, because it is also matriarchal culture there. One of the women took Patricia into her confidence and told her this story before they knew anything about we were going to do anything with these glyphs and told her that there was a story passed down by the Aboriginal elders that Egyptians had come to Egypt, had to Australia many thousand, many thousand years ago and had been there, two sailors, and they talked about them. So when they start translating this inscription, it's exactly fitting the Aboriginal story. So what we have now is these were two sailors, two brothers, who were on an expedition from Egypt and landed in Australia. They set up a colony there. They lived there for a while. One brother died. To commemorate his brother's death, this other brother, with only a crude understanding of his language, wrote an inscription on the wall giving a prayer and a blessing to his brother. Muhammad Ibrahim and Yusuf Awiyan sat down and they have retranslated this so that it makes perfect sense and that's what the inscription is saying. Not only that, can date it to around 500 BCE, which would be 2,500 years ago. So it is thousands of years old. You're right. And the patina on it, which a lot of people have looked at, says it has to be old. So it's not modern. Again, people said it's in the 70s and the 60s. No, impossible. But we have come up with information that supports that. Now finding evidence from Australian archaeologists were commenting on this wall in the 20s. Someone has said there's even an article perhaps in 1904 where some Australian archaeologists were commenting on these glyphs. Nobody knew a written Egyptian language then. It was not published in any text, neither British nor American nor any, any, nor any culture had produced a hieroglyphic dictionary at that point, 1904, or even in the 20s. The first hieroglyphic dictionary came out in modern times in the 30s. So how do so, you are? Are you cool with it now? Do you think yes, it's legitimate? There's no doubt. They proved it to me. Both both Yusuf and Muhammad have proven to me that this is true. It's about 500 BCE. It's a it's a legitimate uh, inscription. So it shows we believe Australians made it. I mean, Egyptians made it to Australia. We also believe they made it to Peru. We see Incas use symbols that are ancient Comitian symbols. There's no doubt. They use this concept of the false door which we see all over Egypt, which behind it is a water tunnel, which the archaeologists, Egyptologists say, no, they made these false doors to kind of confuse tomb robbers. Well, the point is, you talked about the Valley of the Kings. All of the tunnels are under the Giza Plateau. These were originally water channels. We can prove now that so-called Valley of the Kings, those were not cut as tombs. They are water channels that were modified to be tombs. You talked about, like, you can go into the rooms and you can see all these inscriptions and the pictures and the depictings. Well, some of them are incomplete. If you keep going back, which Zahi Was never took anybody on television to see, which Egyptologists don't take any tourists to see, that they're unfinished chambers in some of these tombs. Wait a minute, the tomb was completed. Somebody was buried here. Why did they leave these extra rooms unfinished? Because they were water channels. And all they did was modify a certain part of it to make tombs for the royals at those times, that they, again, the religion was a money-making game. The money-making game was death, funerals, burials. They modified these water channels, water tunnels, to become tombs. They cut none of these things. These are all pre-dynastic. The water channels were... Zahi was proved it to us, because he made a statement that he let slip out one time that they had found a tomb, supposedly an unfinished tomb, under the Valley of the Kings that went for two and one half miles. Say what? It was never finished. Nobody ever buried there. There's no inscriptions. There's nothing there. It's a water channel. Cleopatra, maybe? Finished. Cleopatra? Maybe? Maybe? No. <laughs> um, what? All of these sites, originally the whole idea was to create a whole hydraulic systems underneath them to bring water to these sites, which the crystal, which the not, to create the energy zones, and then they would build pyramids, then they would build temples, all connected in energy grids. When I talk about the land of Osiris, I'm talking about the site of Dashur in the south, the Abu Dawash in the north, which includes Saqqara, Giza, 25 square miles of underground tunnels connecting together water channels, all had stone masonry pyramids, all had temples, all connected in an energy grid. Who's the guy, who's the archaeologist that deals with the Valley of the Kings and KV-75? And so, what's his name? KV-55. Right? Yeah, 55. What's his Ken name? Weeks from yeah, Ken, Ken Weeks. Yeah, Ken Weeks. Ken Weeks. Does uh, Ken Weeks, and I love Ken. Ken's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, does Ken know about this uh, uh, undiscovered or uh, last uh, uh, tunnel no, they, in they, the Valley they, of the he Kings? He might, because I, he, you know, they might know it and they just don't talk about it. 
Interesting. They probably think, oh, somebody's buried two and a half miles in the mountain. There must be some very, you know, Zahi was always digging in the Valley of the Kings because they had the king's list, so they knew that there was still undiscovered tombs. They're looking for Ramses nine or Ramses twelve, or one of them, you know. They're sort of always been digging there, looking for other people. You know, Tut was found totally by accident in 1922. I mean, it was, it was the last season. He'd been looking. Carter had known that there was a king Tutankhamun, and had been looking since 1905. But uh, Car- uh, Carnarvon, Lord Carnarvon, was about out of money to keep financing. It was the last season, and they found it just by accident under another tomb. Are there any missing uh, tombs? Uh, does everything, I, I research this all the time, I can never get a firm answer. It's weird. Is every pharaoh accounted for Absolutely with the tomb? Not. Absolutely not. How many are we missing? Hundreds. Let's, let's put, it, put it to rest there, right there's now. There's missing dynasties. There's missing dynasties, sure. There's many, many. They're constantly finding. They're constantly finding more burials all the time. Constantly finding more burials in, in the Valley of the Kings or yes, outside. All of the... around in Luxor itself. There's a val- not only Valley of the Kings. There's a Valley of the Queens. There's a Valley of the Nobles. That's right. That's right. Um, but it's, so not every pharaoh is accounted for. Oh no, by not by long shot. Wow, that's interesting. Um, uh, so there's so much. I I, I was uh, talking to Jason. One of the only we used to always say the only thing we ever agreed with Zahi Was about is you'd always say publicly we've only found about eighteen percent of what's still buried under the sand. We would agree with that. <laughs> why? Why don't we go out there? And I'm not being cavalier. Why don't we go out there with a bunch of leaf blowers? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why? 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 Why keep it covered up, and why uh, why the mystery there when we know that sand is covering up cities, uh, temples, history, uh, uh, information? Just just it's it's all that. Why aren't we doing that? Why do we just let it sit That's there? That's another classic question that's always asked. But it, again, why do we have these disagreements with academia? Why are we always complaining today that knowledge is being withheld? This is this cycle. We are in the cycle of Amun, the last stage, fifth stage of the sun. It's night. It's darkness. When things are polarity, it's been characterized by patriarchal religions, by Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, by wars around those, by institutionalized warfare, by, by all these isms, sexism, racism, ageism, feminism, all these isms, all these separations, us and them, us and them, us and them. So the idea is, is truth being fully disseminated? Are things known? Again, another Zahi Hua story. I can tell a million of them. He supposedly, uh, again, this is an unknown source, and I'm not going to give the source out, but someone told me, well, Zahi likes to drink. One night, this gentleman was having dinner with Zahi Hua in, in a Cairo restaurant. Zahi got very drunk and then said to him, look, I know the Great Pyramid was not a tomb for a king. I know it's thousands of years older, but if you say I told you that, I will put you in jail for libel. Well, you know what? Even drunk, um, he said that. I've, I, I had a, uh, I, I, I know one of his uh, cameramen, and he told me, I, I've said this before on the show, so it doesn't matter. I'll say it again. And <laughs> it's, it's third hand, but the point is, he said, Zahi was claustrophobic. That's right. And he would not, he would have other people going in front of him, you know, the cameras and everything right. else, and That's he'd right. yell out from the back, what do you see? <laughs> but he would never do it himself. That's right. I'm like, how can you be the guy, the cat, the man, and and be claustrophobic and don't and don't? And I'm not, I'm not saying I I have claustrophobia. I'm never gonna go into the king's chamber. I I have oh, issues well, with that. Well, you know what? I've actually had people come on tour with me who were. And we would say, you know, see if you can get up there. We'll have people along the way. If you can't, you go out and you go, and you try. I had one woman who actually did it, stayed an hour in the king's chamber, and finally she said she had to leave. And she left, but she overcame her claustrophobia after that. Wow. Well, you know what? No, I think I'm the guy standing on the outside. Well, uh, if, you got, if you stood on the outside and had the opportunity, I mean, you might change your mind and try. Uh, but it, the good thing about it is you, the entrance that goes in is a small little opening. It's called the robber's entrance. That was forced entrance in 810 BC, but right. 810 AD. Right. And you can stand up in there. When you have to start to squat down is then when you might get claustrophobic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and yeah. the queen's chamber down. Ooh, man. The, the king's chamber is tough, too. You have to climb up the yeah, yeah, gallery yeah, yeah. and squat down. But in the king's chamber, of course, it's 19 feet high. You can stand up tall. Right. Yeah, tell me, uh, Stephen, have you uh, spent the night in there? 
No, always have wanted to. It was almost arranged at one time. It was time when you could do that. There's another famous book that impressed me a lot, by, written by a man named Paul Brunton. It's called A Search in Secret Egypt. He spent the night in the Great Pyramid in 1935. You could do it then. You could do it. Again, the Grateful Dead did it. Again, part of this 1978 thing is they supposedly dropped acid, spent the whole night in the great in the king's chamber, <laughs> and Mickey Hart recorded it and has never public, never let anybody hear it. So, but yes, you could and up until maybe 2000s, you could spend the night in the Great Pyramid if you paid enough money. Well, I asked Robert Shock. I said, "So, Robert, you spent the night in there?" And, I, and he says, "Yeah." And I said, "Okay." Uh, he did. Well, I said, "What happened, uh, Jimmy? That's personal." Right. And he wouldn't tell me. And I That's tried. Right. I worked him for about 20 minutes, man. I That's couldn't right. couldn't get him to. Uh, well, Paul Brunton describes in detail what happened to him during the night. <laughs> you know, all the ex pharaohs, all the priests, everybody came back to him. Oh, he had many, many out of body experiences. I mean, again, there was an initiation that they did in dynastic times. It's called the Osirian initiation. It is the final initiation. You were to spend three days in the box. In the king's chamber Ooh. without food and water. Ooh. And if you didn't go crazy, insane, or kill yourself, you passed the initiation. Ooh. <laughs> oh, man. Because supposedly wow. all the spirits and all the ancestors and everybody comes to visit you, all the demons, all the jinn. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah, they they were pushing people in there. No, I don't want to go. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I would do though. We we actually, three days, three in days. 19, in nineteen ninety seven, we were paying to, for Hakim, my research partner Bob Water, and I to go in the Great Pyramid after midnight, and we were going to spend a couple of hours in there at least till three four in the morning. But uh, we, a whole series of things came off, and we were attempted. One of Zahi Hawass's minions attempted to rip us off, and it didn't happen. But now it's impossible to do that. You, you even today the cost is doubled to for the groups to get private time in the Great Pyramid. We do that. Our group features that. That's part of what people pay for when they come on tour with us. Is we get two hours inside the Great Pyramid. Is time. there is there uh, and is there another level of like bribery where you can really shrink down the group? Maybe one or two people. Yes. You know, you know what I'm saying. You yeah. Know. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, what about you know, at least thousands of dollars we're talking about? Well, that's well. If you're going to go, you but might as not, well do you it. You know, beyond again, there are rich people who've done it. Like you said, Shock did it. Probably, he, he, you know, he, if you have another, again, when we used to come, people would come with us. When they come off the plane in Egypt, they're looking at all their tour guides, and he says, "It's forbidden to do this. Right. It's forbidden to do that." Right. I would say what that means is more bakshi. Right. Bakshi is the form <laughs> of reference. It means who you got to buy. Whatever right, we would right. go anywhere. Like, we never could get into the Bent Pyramid at Dashur, Hakim and I. Uh, Yusuf has been inside since. But we could never get in there. Hakim would always say, if I would say, can we go here? Can we go there? He would always say, it all depends on who has the key. Interesting. And <laughs> Hakim always had the key, too. Well, he knew who had the key. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh, hey, what about uh, what about the uh, the Tomb of Osiris? Have you been down there? No, that's a that's a that's a, a major channel that's under the again. It's no tomb, no Osiris, nothing in there. But it's a main water channel. A made. Uh, I've seen pictures of people who've been down there. It goes down many levels. There's levels. You know, um, it's a hundred feet. It's a hundred feet. That yes. Ryan has posted. And again, I tell people go to www. Hidden. Incavideos.com. His tour site is hiddenincatours.com. He has a subsite, hiddenincavideos.com. They can see many videos. Yusuf took Brian three. Yakim would say some of the chambers go down 300 meters. He, Brian, uh, Yusuf really? took Brian three layers above. Oh, there is again. If you would think of these water channels like you think of your circulatory system with arteries, veins, arterioles, venules. There are levels and levels of tunnels crisscrossing. They would have water crisscrossed to create these fields. And we well, have evidence that there were tunnels on the, on the surface, and there were, there were holes they carved in the, in the bedrock, in the limestone bedrock, circular and square holes to get solar energy, to have the sun heating the water as it was coursing. So they used a solar energy to heat the water from the surface. They used a much colder water full of nutrients and minerals coming from deep in the bowels of the earth, coming from underneath, mix those waters together, and those were the energy fields. What do you mean there's no tomb of Osiris? Then what What do you call that? I mean, there's a lid That's to this. That's just the term that was put out there. I actually put the term out there, believing that Osiris was buried under the Giza Plateau. No, the, the, in there was found a beautiful blue, rare, 
blue granite stone box. Of course, I yes. had pried it open. I've there seen was it. There was nobody. There was no nothing in there. Right. Well, a serious. Well, yeah. Okay. Metaphor. Maybe, yeah. but yeah. Uh, there is definitely you know the lid, and then you have the four columns that are there. Well, but also, but what is there is a main chamber room where other water channels are coming into this room, like the spokes of a wheel. So this was a main residence room. Again, we don't call these tombs. We don't say they're connected to any one particular netter, Osiris, wizard being a netter. We're saying that this was this was before religion was even created, before they even had a concept of where they put labels on the netters. They understood energy through water and crystal. So all these tunnels were there. there again, the, Edgar Casey with the halls of records, the records of the stones itself. There's no written records because when these things were built, there was no writing. So the stone itself are the halls of records. Hakim would always say the sites, the pyramid, the sphinx, the tunnels, the stones themselves are the halls of records. Really? Do, do you, you don't think it exists then? No. It, really? No written records, no. There's no writing. The Sphinx was built 54,000 years ago. We date writing thousands of years earlier than the, than the Egyptologists and the archaeologists do. They date writing coming from Sumer around 4,000 B.C. Then the Egyptians all of a sudden created hieroglyphs out of nowhere around 3,500 to 3,300 B.C.E. Nonsense. Writing goes back to 6,000 B.C.E. and we can trace it. And the, and the, and the uh, Sumerian writing was a short form of the glyphs. The glyphs came before. But there was no formal system of writing. They used symbols, they used notations before 6000 BCE. These structures we're talking about and how we recognize pre-cataclysmic structures are perfectly cut corners, perfectly flat surfaces, no writing, no symbols whatsoever. What about, what about Edgar Cayce's claims, of course, you know, underneath the paw? Right. Yeah, uh, are you saying... And Zahiwas has been down there. Uh, SRS, Stanford Research Institute, drilled down there. There also was a gentleman named Joseph Shore, a multimillionaire, who had used, Florida, used, the, used the facilities of Florida State University mm -hmm. to mount an expedition in the 90s where they drilled in down there. And they found a room under the right paw of the Sphinx, 45 by 45. When Zahiwas went on television to talk about it, he said it was a crack. It's just a natural crack. There's no room. There's nothing down there. No, of course there's rooms down there. There are rooms, but there's no written record. And of course, Zahi has been down there. So if there are any artifacts or anything of importance, it's already been emptied. But there aren't rooms. Again, if you follow the teachings of Drundal and Melchizedek, he talks about energy rooms down there, a blue room where there's like an electromagnetic field. There's no records, written records. The tunnels themselves are the records in stone. Did you say crack? How That's how bizarre he would yeah, say. say say it again, say it again. It's just, it's just a natural crack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Steve, so I would go me. on radio like your show tonight and said, yeah, the crack was in his head. Uh, I mean, he <laughs> knew he was lying. He was always lying about all of these things. This is the thing. To show you the unscrupulousness of the man and how he operated, he made Joseph Shore and the Shore Foundation give a $10 million grant to the Supreme Council of Antiquities so that they could have the permit to drill under the Sphinx. They did this. They found this. At Stanford Research Institute followed up in 95 and found the same thing. So I attended a conference in 1996 in the University of Delaware. Shock was there. Bouval was there. West was there. Uh, uh, Barbara Ann Clow was there. And there was a man named Joe Jehoda, who was an engineer working with Joseph Shore Foundation. He blabbed at this conference. He said what they had found down there was this room, 45 by 45. There's definitely something down there, and we didn't find anything in it. When Zahiwas found out about that, he, see, Zahiwas would make everybody sign what's called a non-disclosure agreement. Before, when you would do any kind of digging, any time of excavations in Egypt, you had to clear anything you found with him. You could not publish or print anything or print or interview unless it was cleared by him and the Supreme Council of Antiquities. They signed this document. So they violated that. He pulled it and he kept the $10 million, pulled the plug and kicked him out of Egypt. And couldn't come back. And so that's the punishment if you spoke. Yep. I mean, interesting. Oh, not only that, people who work for him got fired. If they would, re would release a site report of things that they found in an excavation that he had not gone through with a fine tooth comb and edited and said what was to be released or what was not to be released, they would be fired instantaneously. What do you think is behind uh, Gate and Brink's door? Ah, 
uh, again, uh, people should go to Chris Dunn's website, gizapower.com. He did some of the most work there. What it shows was what 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 Gattenbring had found is that there was a shaft that opened up. There were a copper uh, uh, handles on this. It, it, Chris believes it was working with acid, with liquids. I think it was to test uh, the water levels. So there was some type of a gateway valve there for the water to come in. It had nothing to do with any tomb or anything found in there. So you don't think there's another room on the other side? Actually, what Chris Dunn thinks is that what what the image is found, and he put it it's on his website, people can find it. He actually thinks it goes straight and then goes down, which would establish what his theory was of how they produced chemicals and they produced the hydrogen gas. So he actually thinks it doesn't go straight up through the pyramid, it went down. That was one of the coolest periods of my life. Again, with he kicked Gattenbrink out. He did the same thing to Yeah, yeah he did the same Gattenbrink thing to Gattenbrink revealed what he was finding, and yep. so he kicked yep. him out. Yep. And when they did the other Fox special in the 2000s yep. with another robot going up there, Zahi had already commissioned another company to do it. He right. kicked Gattenbrink out. Uncool. So and, 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 but that. what I was going to say was that was a really cool period of about a year, year and a half with Gattenbrink, the suspense you know, uh, right. looking at it and looking right. at the pictures and just wondering what was on the other side of that door. Right. Yeah. What do you do? You think that there are other chambers yes, inside the Great there Pyramid? Are. There are other rooms in the Great Pyramid. Yes, we know there are. I have found evidence of that. And and what but evidence? Nobody's buried there. There's nothing. Again, they, these rooms served reasons for acoustic resonance. That's what the King's Chamber does because the King's Chamber is all rose granite. The Queen's Chamber is all limestone, produces a different vibratory effect. But the amazing thing about the King's Chamber, all rose granite. And it's perfectly rectangular. It has in there the, the golden section, the golden mean, uh, uh, the, supposedly the mathematical function E. It's a perfect rectangular room, perfect harmonic resonance. It's tuned to A, 438 to 440, although some people now are getting into the idea of 432 being the perfect resonance. Right. Uh, uh, but it was tuned to that. The box was tuned to F sharp. It's already been measured by musicians, by acoustic engineers. So it was a per Again, first recording done in there was done by Paul, uh, uh, Doug, a man named Steve Douglas, not Paul Horn. Everybody knows about Paul Horn recording in the King's Chamber. The first gentleman in 1976 was a jazz musician named Steve Douglas. He actually played the flute and did chanting in there. And, and I actually had the album for a long time, the LP of it. And then Paul Horn went in there in 1978, I believe, and recorded inside the, the King's Chamber. It is the most perfect resonant room in the world. Uh, let's take a quick call. This is Dino. Dino, say hi to Stephen Mailer. How are you tonight? Hi, I'm I'm doing well. Uh, Stephen, um, there, there's so many things. I'm just going to throw out about two or three sure. random things, and you respond as you wish. Um, uh, the Rosicrucians, <clears throat> I grew up on them looking at them in the Sunday paper about consciousness. Uh, it's amazing to hear uh, how much of this is tied into Egyptology. Exactly. Uh, Number two, the Grateful Dead uh, at a time when uh, Egyptians loved Americans, but they were the only people ever allowed to play in front of those sacred places, supposedly. But now, the third thing I want to bring up is I've learned so much. You seem to corroborate what we've heard on Jimmy's program uh, from other experts in this field, that it's all changing. It's all cover-ups. It's all, uh, is it Illuminati, New World Order? I mean, it makes you wonder what else is hidden from us. So if you wanted to respond to any of those things, and one more thing, I had a friend who's still around, Dr. David Smith, who uh, did a lot of uh, athletic challenges around the world, and he had told me, and I believe it's in his book, uh, Uncommon Athlete, A Healing Journey, uh, that he was allowed to meditate in the King's Chamber, and he told me, and I think he said it in the book, that he heard a voice that told him, you heal leaders. So I don't know, any of those things you want to respond to? Oh, sure. Yeah, thank all you so it, much, Dino. Thank you so much. Things right. I've experienced. Bye. Um, yeah, again, this is why even today, if you go around in Egypt, you will find kids in their 20s and teens wearing Grateful Dead t-shirts, because the Grateful Dead made a tremendous impression in 1978. All the concerts they performed were free, and so the Egyptian kids and the youth of the 70s got totally involved in American music, and that's why they love American music today. So he's absolutely right what he said about that. They were great ambassadors for peace, and they were the only group allowed to ever perform in front of the I thought, Didn't Yanni do a Yes, concert? Yanni did later. You're right. With, uh, an Egyptian, he actually had Egyptian singers and performed. I saw that. It was actually pretty cool. It was. Okay. He had Egyptian musicians. Right. Sting also has done. Right. He was right. Up until 
up until Mubarak allowed that to happen in the 2000s, I think, it was only the Grateful Dead who were ever allowed. And that was, of course, under Sadat, not under Mubarak, when the Grateful Dead were there. Um, many, many people have spiritual experiences in the Great Pyramid. That's one of the things we feature. That's one of the things, again, the tour group started doing in the 80s. Um, I can tell you, again, being a Rosicrucian myself and being under many, many spiritual paths, the greatest out-of-body experiences I've ever had in my life were laying down in the stone box. I had the opportunity to spend 45 minutes in the King's Chamber by myself in the box with the lights out, which we featured too, turning out the lights Ooh. so there's no total blackness. You never experience total Ooh. blackness in your life as you've been in the King's oh, Chamber with the oh, lights oh, out. Man. And yes, many, many people, I've had people come to me with Egypt, uh, uh, Men who were dragged by their husbands, who had no interest in any of the archaeology, forget about the spirituality or metaphysics. They had no interest in that whatsoever. Everybody that goes in the Great Pyramid comes with us and tones with us. Here's the sound. Here's the harmonics. Just sits there in silence. Everybody has an experience to some level, whatever it is. So many, many people have laid down in that box and had some of the greatest meditations, greatest experiences in their life. And there are many, many anecdotal stories. As you were mentioning before, one of the classic stories is Napoleon. Napoleon comes to Egypt in 1798, brings with him all these great scientists who are called savants. And he artists, comes, artists to record it. Brilliant. Yes. Yes, yes brilliant. And so it be known to everybody in the world uh, Napoleon had only been a lesser degree Mason, but when he declared himself Emperor of France, he also declared himself a 33rd degree Mason and said he was the Grand Master. So uh, he understood the Masonic tradition, the different metaphysical traditions about it. He went into the Great Pyramid, went into the King's Chamber by himself, told all the officers to stay outside. He was in there for hours, whatever the time limit, people of different degrees, came out white as a sheet, would never talk about it publicly, what he experienced. He did on his deathbed. He said that in the king's chamber, he saw his Waterloo. Really? Yes. Really? Yes. Why? Have, I did not know that. Oh, yes. Yeah, a famous story. Well, I know he was in the king's chamber. I didn't know that he finally he divulged on his deathbed. I, I need to go look at that. Oh, yeah. Famous story. And many, many others have had profound life-changing experiences just meditating in the Great Pyramid. And uh, I've got calls stacked up here. Let's just uh, keep going. Um, hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Stephen Mailer. Who's calling? Hey, this is Billy. I'm the Trump driver. Hey, Billy. How are you tonight? What, city, what state are you in? Right now, I'm in Iowa. Iowa. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Say hi to Stephen. What have you got for Stephen tonight, hey, Billy? Billy. Well, I'm partic- uh, hi Stephen. It's been wonderful to listen to you. I I resonate. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, yeah. Great pun. Great with, pun. With, with, <laughs> with what with what you're saying, my main interest happens to be exactly that. Um, is there in your purvey any evidence of this ancient vibrational art of altering density in our modern times? And the second, well. I, I, the second, I've had visions in which at, at certain ancient times, we actually somehow sung stone into existence. Beautiful. That, an, 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 another aspect of the vision was that Newt, it wasn't her spit that she was sweating, that she uh-huh. was, it, it was this effervescence that was coming from her. And that was just another aspect. I was just topping that off. But the main question I have is, Evidence that you might have seen of the same vibrational technology, because I am so, that is, I mean, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm, I'm trying to draw the circle around on that one. Thank you so much, Billy. Great questions. Great, Thank great you. questions. Um, um, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, again, all the systems that are in place today that we call alternative healing, where people use crystals, people use sound, people, I have a great friend here in Boulder, Colorado named Jonathan Goldman. I recommend his CDs to everyone that's listening to me. Just Google his name. He has been working with sound healing for many, many years and has gathered many other musicians and people around the world who use sound for healing. One of, uh, um, Vibrational healing is actually done by Hakim's eldest daughter, Shahrazad. She studied with a man named Paul Bucky, who may be even listening tonight, in Hawaii. They came, the idea is called Just Touch, and it's, she calls it BioTouch, or Just Touch, where they use two fingers in the hands to work on the meridians of the body without touching it, working with just vibrational healing again. And sometimes Shahrazad will spontaneously chant. She will sing the great toning. And this is what was done in the ancient times. As he mentioned, sung the stones into that just resonates with me because 
not only was sound sacred to the ancient people, and there was not a written language, but we also believe in the times they built the pyramids, there was not a spoken language. Sound was sacred. Sound was used to cut stone, lift stone, shape stone for healing. We believe that they sung themselves into an immune system where they could live hundreds of years. This is the origin of the patriarchs in the Old Testament. Methuselah, 360, you know, 900 years. Enoch, 365 years, which is exactly measurement of the Great Pyramid. That's why there's many, many stories and traditions that Enoch was the architect the builder. of the Great right, Pyramid because right. 365.4 actually comes out of the Great Pyramid. But again, the origin is that we believe that the sound kept our immune systems in such a high state of existence that bacteria and viruses did not bother us then like they do today. So yes, they would sing themselves into perfect health, and they sang the stones into live, into the anti-gravity fields. They used the human voice with devices. We have a device we can show people in the Cairo Museum that Hakim was the only one that ever pointed out since the 1980s was used to produce a schist plate that looks like a flywheel, many people said, with curves on it. I have pictures of it. We should take everybody to see this. It's out there. One of the amazing things is Zahi Watts did not put this in the basement with other things he did, but he, this is still out there, mislabeled totally, but it produced a sonic field. This sonic field would actually help them lift. So they used their voice. They used uh, uh, implements that were producing ultrasonic frequencies. Yes, they sung the stones beautifully stated. That's a perfect way to see it. This is why so many of the people who get it more than others who come with us are musicians, are people who work with sound every day and could understand how sound can be used. I had an acoustic engineer musician once look at a, at a, 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 a schematic of the Great Pyramid for me, looked at the relieving chambers above, which Chris Dunn has proved were not relieving chambers. They did not re reduce any weight or seismic stress of their structure at all. Only the top structure could have been possibly using any relief of, of pressure, so they're not relieving chambers. No, he looked at it, and he said it was like a comb filter. It was for sonic... And this is exactly what Flinders Petrie found when he was one of the first people to go up there to look at the chambers above the king's chamber, he found that the underside of each level was perfectly flat, perfectly smooth. But the walls inside the chambers were rough and carged. He found that in every one of the chambers. Why? It produces a, a dampening effect, like a filter, to, free, to dampen out certain frequencies and accentuate other frequencies. So yes, we could even say the pyramids were musical instruments, that all pyramids, every pyramid, every temple was tuned to a different frequency of sound. So when this was inactive, this grid we call Bull Wizard, Land of Osiris, was active, it was like an, a, a musical symphony of infrasound. That not necessarily could we hear with our auditory physical ears, but we experienced it, of course. We experience infrasound whether we hear it or not. And it kept our immune systems in the highest level of functioning. It kept people in total bliss. It was the age, the golden age, that all the literature is written about. It was the time that's talked about in all the texts when there were no wars and there were no gods and there were no religion. It's had, hard for people to conceive that we actually existed for thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years like that before the modern time that we have now, which is really just the last five to 6,000 years, this last stage of the sun. Uh, and it's beautiful what he said, moisture. The reason why Hakim said, she, they said tefnut, spit, is because every time we expectorate, to use the scientific term, mm -hmm. it's different. There's no volume, there's no mass. So what they were basically saying is you cannot define the Great Mother. You cannot define her. She exists in, in, in the infinite and in the, in the material. But if you want to define her, we'll say she spit in this spot and we create the statue to moderate her. But you, you cannot define her. There's no volume, there's no weight every time we, we spit or expect her. We just uh, tweeted uh, the picture of that disc. I don't even know how to explain what. It, and anyway, hold on. A, a few seconds, a few minutes ago, you had mentioned uh, that you had evidence of other chambers inside of the Great Pyramid, what, and and we got away from that. What were you? Uh, uh, you mean of other chambers? Yes, inside oh, the Great there Pyramid. Is, there is what. The, what before you go into the King's Chamber, people who know go up the Grand Gallery. You have to duck down. It's what's called an antechamber. And there actually is a couple of room you can stand up, and then you have to duck down again. At one time in, um, 
I would say it's probably 1998, because this is when Zahi was doing... Zahi was doing a lot of uh, illegal dun- tunneling and digging in the Great Pyramid in the late 90s. I think this was 1998. There was a grate. There is a grate there that's covered up. It was open, and there's another shaft that went up. And I crawled up there, and I found that there's other chambers up there. And then since then, it's been closed off. In fact, some of these rooms have been sealed up. So again, somebody said before, you actually said it. Is there a conspiracy to keep this information from us? Of course. Do we talk now conspiracy theory? Well, when there's facts involved, it's not theory anymore. It's conspiracy facts. That's right. That's right. And so we know certain things have been changed, altered, documents hidden, things covered up. Yes, I've always said one of my dreams is to go into the basement of the Cairo Museum because I know they have kept things there that are anomalies that they don't want public to see, that have proof of the ancient civilization, of the engineering we're talking about. So sure. There was, there, there was warehouses all over Egypt, and these things were looted when the revolution, when Mubarak was overthrown. The people knew where these things were. Zahi had had warehouses, storehouses all over Egypt when antiquities were stored. Have you seen the Dassault video on the construction of the pyramid? You know, the French company Dassault? Yes. Have you seen the video, the no, animation? You should look that up. It's, it's simple. Just look up Dassault. Uh, great pyramid and they've got a really good video. now it's again it's theory but one of the things that they present i'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this we're almost out of time but one of the things that they present is how the workers got out of the king's chamber once they sealed it up with the traps on the other side you know with the with the granite blocks that fell down so but but there were workers on the inside they had to leave and so inside the great pyramid I mean, inside the king's chamber, behind the box, if you're looking uh, lengthwise in the king's chamber, so the box is on the opposite side of you. And to, it's not its original position. Flinders Peachy found that, that is correct. The box was originally between what are called the ventilation shafts. That's right. But I'm just uh, so, but I just want you to reference uh, the area that DeSalt talks about. So on the far, on the right side of where the box is positioned now, there's a discolored block in the wall there. Cool. On the floor. On the floor. And that's, that was the exit. And that, is, that, is, uh, that leads down that uh, long hallway that goes underneath one of the... the uh, it's possible because I've seen it when it was no... It used to be an iron grating there. When we went in 92, from 97, 98, right. up until the early 2000s, it was just an iron grating there. Then Zahi Was had it plastered over. Oh, yeah, there was an entrance there. It led down somewhere for sure. Yeah, yeah, and that was the exit. The right, pyramid. right. We also know that there was possible to entrance the upper chambers the upper chambers from another way. Zahi Was was digging in the Queen's chamber. That's going right. Going back in the wall of the Queen's chamber in 1997 to try to come up to the relieving chambers through that way, thinking he was going to find something, Khufu's body. I mean, he always thought he was going to find something that would make him famous. You know. Uh, and what about uh, the Japanese when they did all of the side-scanning radar uh, research in there? They supposedly had found a, a bunch of chambers, too, and then... Correct. Zahi you know what also? This is Waseda University. People can Google that name. W A S E D A. Right. They had a. They had permits and, and, and uh, to dig and to work in the Great Pyramid in the 1990s. Supposedly in the late 1990s, they found the fact that the King's Chamber is not attached to the substructure of the pyramid. Let me say that again. The King's Chamber is a flea, free floating room, and what did the Japanese find? That it floats on quartz sand. Interesting. They also found, and this is, again, we've always been looking for these documents. To, to, you know, again, we talk about things, it sounds anecdotal. What I'm saying, again, people always say, where's the proof, where's the evidence? Of course, we have to have that if we're going to be scientific. But supposedly, the Japanese found that that quartz sand was radioactive. And they had published it on their website. It has been since taken down, and nobody can find a reference to it today. With, um, oh, I meant to ask you about Gobekli Tepe. Uh, yes. uh, you know what? We may have, uh, can you hang on for five more minutes? Yes, I can. Okay, then we'll get to, well, actually, I usually say Gobekli Tepe in every show. I just got it out of the way. But we'll get to that in a second. One of the things that DeSalt presents in their video, and it's a fascinating theory, they, they present that the blocks that we see on the outside of the pyramid go in only about three or four blocks deep. Everything else on the inside is like filler, okay, uh, gravel, if you will. Mm, and so, no. well, uh, that's why I'm asking. So they, <laughs> so they, you know, they they went up uh, every level, brought in the rock, uh, brought in the uh, the the uh, stones, 
and and went three or four deep, but then it was filler, and then the, and, and that's how. So the inside. No, what they're talking about, what they say, is different stone was used. What you're calling the casing stones, which is the outer stones, of course, were a different type of limestone called Tura limestone, very that's pure right. calcium carbonate. The inner blocks were cut, were actually acquired from the plateau itself. Are a different form of limestone. So they're saying perhaps. The, the inner blocks are different blocks put together, but they're still precision. It's still put in with a perfect square, perfect perfect precision put in. And again, one of the things Zahi Huas never allowed to be put into public is he said that in the core of the Great Pyramid, he found a foundation block of limestone, again, in the core of the Great Pyramid, which they estimated to weigh 800 tons. No, really? Oh, yeah. Um, well, so what so you're saying... Filler. Well, filler, filler is not achieving the effect. They did different layering of stone. Again, we've got physicists, we've got electrical engineers in the audience. Think of Faraday cages. Think of these... When you layer different types of metal, mm-hmm. it creates different types of electrical charges. Again, this stone is full of quartz crystal, piezoelectric. It, it, makes a, it can make an incoherent electrical charge coherent. So you have lime, one type of limestone layered with another type of limestone. That's right. All also laid with rose granite yep. and calcite and basalt, all for a reason. Each so, stone was chosen for its particular vibratory frequency, for its particular quartz content. Again, I return to the master. Nikola Tesla said, if you understand frequency and vibration, you understand everything. So you're saying, uh, in, in DeSalt's video, like I said, it's filler, you know, it's, it's, it's gravel. It's, it's loose gravel. No, no, no. no. So you're saying blocks. that those, those limestone cut, blocks cut all machine, the way through. Perfectly squared limestone blocks. So when, they, when you hear two and a half million blocks, we're talking solid blocks all the way in and every it's just level. an estimate. Somebody did another computer estimate a couple of years ago, estimated there's 3.9 million blocks of stone in the Great Pyramid. It Insane. weighs anywhere between six and seven million tons sits on 13 acres each side is not exactly the same again they didn't have an exact people say why is their mathematics not exact because they knew that's how the universe is everything yeah, right, 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 everything right, changes. Right. we estimate the side of the great pyramid to be 755 feet but you know that there is not one of the four sides that is 755 feet one is 757 one is 754 one is 756 one is 753 <laughs> it comes to an estimate you take the four sides seven that's how they come up with 755 you know, while the rest of the world, while the west, while the rest of the world was wearing, you know, uh, animal skins and carrying clubs around, the Egyptians just managed to build a foundation that large of solid rock to build the pyramid on it that was perfectly north and stable and as weathered time like it is today. It is. It, even if it was built five thousand years ago, even if even it, which it wasn't, but even if it was, that still is an impossibility. Exactly. You know that's that's the only way to look at it. Exactly, and only if you could do it with advanced machining and engineering. It that's can't right. be done with slaves on sledges. It's nonsense. Copper chisel doesn't cut granite. I mean, we still have people arguing with us today on Facebook, on the on websites all the time. Oh, if you use wet copper, if you do this, uh, and, and it's certainly hard. How, to how come copper. nobody's ever demonstrated that? Why oh, is it? Chris Dunn has. Chris Dunn has. No, 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 no. I'm talking about Egyptologists. I want an Egyptologist to get out a a, a copper chisel and carve right. out a rock. Why? Why haven't they done it? They can't. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know what? If you can, if you want us, if you want us to swallow that, if you want us to buy what you're selling, right. prove it to me. Exactly, and that's the point. That's why we're dealing with demonstrations. We do, we can demonstrate. We can show the acoustic energy. We can have people understand the acoustics. We can see. We bring engineers and in there, and the engineers are not stuck in the academic paradigms of Egyptologists or, or this and that. They look and they see how it could be done today. Again, Chris Dunn did that. When I talk about these granite boxes in the Serapium, perfect boxes out of one piece of granite. Uh, he went to modern people today, people who work in granite today, and said, how would you do that? And they said, first of all, we wouldn't do that. No, we piece. couldn't. We would bolt together four sides. <laughs> we would get four different sides, bolt it together, and, you know, and, and he said, it wouldn't be cost efficient today. Nobody would do that. So, could we do that? Yes, Chris Dunn says, with the technology we have today, we could make a box like the ancient commissions did, but it would cost millions of dollars for one box. Who would do that? <laughs> well, you know why they did it? 
because it was easy. It was easy. <laughs> <laughs> they cut through granite and oh, yeah. like it was clay. Like it was, and this is exactly. Why people, and there's one more theory we should end with. Just before, I want to leave people with that because people think there was a French chemist named Joseph Davidovitz who came out of a book in 1996 saying that it's all concrete. It's cast, that they use molds and all that stone. Not it a bad idea. It. It's not a bad idea. It's not a bad theory. No, it doesn't work at all because we've tested the stone. It's natural stone. And okay. you wouldn't have drill marks. You wouldn't have cut marks if you if you're molding the stone. And it would take and no two blocks in the pyramid or in any of the temples are exactly the same. So it would take thousands and thousands of different molds. No molds have ever been found. The stone has been tested. I've been working with a chemist, a, a great engineer who hopes is going to join me in Egypt in March. Uh, in, he has a laboratory in Pittsburgh. We've tested it under microscopes, spectroscopy, all the scientific testing. It's natural stone. Davidovitz was absolutely wrong. There's no concrete, no synthetic stone. They would not have even conceived of using synthetic stone. Again, I leave you with this. They chose the stone because of its crystalline natural vibration. No concrete, no synthetic stone would ever be thought of in their mind. They had, you said that yourself, they took it because they could do it, because they could cut it, because they could build it, because they could lift it, because they could place it in position. It's space, age, precision that we can only duplicate in the last 50 years things done in Egypt over 20,000 years ago. They would never have considered making synthetic stone or concrete. Yes, they had mortar. No doubt they used mortar. The Romans ad- invented concrete based on ideas they got from the ancient commissions, no doubt. But they used natural stone because it was what God, if you will, what nature provided. The stone was everywhere. They knew where the granite quarries were. They knew where the basalt was. They knew where the diorite was. They knew where the calcite was. They knew how to cut it. They used their senses, 360 senses, operating in, in full consciousness, which we are nowhere near today. Bam. Stephen Mailer, fly a mission. Drop a bomb. <laughs> Man. Hey, uh, really quick. I, I, uh, have you been to go Beckley Tepe? No, but uh, it's, that's next on our list. Uh, uh, we don't think it's as old as people think it is. What? Because it's got, no, it's not older than Giza, for sure. Oh, not no, no, no. No, Giza. but it's been dated 12,500 BC. I think it's less. I think the dating is wrong. I think it's less than 12,000 years, less than 10,000 years. It is post-cataclysmic. Why? There are why, 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 why? In Turkey, there are many sites in Turkey that are pre-cataclysmic. There may be some. We have to go there and see it again. I cannot give a final judgment on anything like that until I go there myself. Sure. So that's on our list. We're thinking maybe in 2016, maybe in the future, the Kemet School of Ancient Mysticism will be leading a tour to Turkey, and we'll go to Gobekli Tepe. Give me a yes or no question on this. This has been sitting up here for a while. This is from Spiritual Warrior. Is it true that the resonance is perfectly pitched within the chambers that they could produce light? Yes. Really? Very good. Very good. Wow, I didn't know that. Oh, you can hit tones. You can hit sound frequencies where you can see flashes of light. Wow, I didn't know that. Oh, yes, that's very good. Somebody there has done their homework. Stephen Mailer, I got to get you back on the show. Definitely. And, and uh, I had a great time tonight. I told you it would be awesome, and it, it was all that for me. I hope it was great for you. Same for me. Same for me. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And as I told you, we would go wherever you wanted to go with it, and we did. We didn't even we didn't even touch South America, man. We didn't. No, we I didn't know. touch. That's Mexico. why we have to come back. <laughs> I so look forward to it. And again, we want people to know if they go to the website, we're leading this tour with Brian Foster, March eighth to twenty first, and then we're going to Baalbek. So please, people, come on. We've, we're taking registrations now. The tour is filling, and it's going to be an outstanding tour. We've got many, many great people already signed up. Chematology dot com. It's a great website. The videos are awesome. Also, Brian Forster's website, too, as well, Inca. Hidden uh, Inca Hidden, Tours. Hidden Inca Tours. Uh, so it's, it's, I, I spent so much time there. It's ridiculous. Great. So thank you so much, Stephen. You have thank a great you, night, and we'll talk soon. All the best. We will. Stephen Mailer. <laughs> Check this out. Wasn't that awesome? That is why. I say, you know, it's kind of funny. I say it after every show. That is why we do this show. That is why we do this show. But that's why we do this show. You need to come here and learn something. You know, last, uh, Carmen Bolter last week, uh, Brian Forster the week before, of course, Jason Martell last week. We've uh, done an awful lot of Egypt, and and I cannot get enough of it. And just when you think, you know, everything, you know, how much there's so much to talk about, so much to explore, and you bring on a guy like uh, uh, Stephen Mailer. Hang on for a second. 
Okay, I'm just looking at a text from Keith. Sorry about that. I need glasses. So, so much. Listen, I hope everybody had a great show tonight and had a great time with us. I promised you one thing at the beginning of the show. I hope I delivered, which is we're going to disconnect for three hours tonight. That's what we're going to do. Let's check out and disconnect for three hours. And I hope I delivered because I did. I disconnected. I didn't look at CNN one time, but now I've got to. So I hope everybody had a great time. Thank you so much. This is Fade to Black, the spoke radio for the masses. Follow us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter, which is at J Church Radio. YouTube is Fade to Black. Coming up next is, hold on, hold on, Sky Watchers Replay. It's kind of a misnomer. Sky Watchers Replay. What does that even mean? But that is coming up next on Dark Matter. Special thanks to Keith Rowland and Art Bell. Faded Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm and Mark T. Kovar. Thanks to LJ3, Renee, and Jonas. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar, Fady by Dale. Graphics by Method. Music is by Doug Aldrich. Intro by Space Boy. We're going to have Doug on the show tomorrow night, by the way. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Dark Matter Radio Network. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Thanksgiving's coming up. Are you guys ready? Well, you know what? Tomorrow night, Linda Moulton Howe right here. Be safe. See ya. See ya.